Good evening, everyone. All right, we're going to start our board meeting. So welcome to our PVUSD board meeting. We have translation available in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Virginia Gonzalez in the back. Uh, trustee Dodge Jr. and our student trustees send their regrets, but they will not be able to attend this evening. As noted on the agenda, Vice President Jennifer Shocker will be participating remotely. Trustee Orozco will be uh, reading the names of the public speakers and keeping time. And if somebody would like to share, or would like to speak to an item that is on the agenda, then you must complete a speaker card and hand it in to Eva Renteria prior to the start of the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes, and we know that it is it can be easy to lose track of time. So Trustee Orozco has a 30 second warning card just to kind of give you a heads up so we don't have to interrupt your speaking. Um, all right, so I will ask um, Trustee Orozco to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Dr. Rodriguez, our superintendent, will make yeah. your comments. All right, thank you so much. So first and foremost, I hope that next week um, everyone has a fantastic um, Thanksgiving. I know that we, after having all of us survived a pandemic, we have much to be thankful for. And so um, I hope that everyone has a wonderful time off. Um, we do, we hope that students do attend school the day, the first couple of days of the week as um, it isn't a whole week off. Um, and then also um, I just want to mention because at the time, the the deadline is coming up soon. So in the 2028 school year, we started a new project where um, we provided a, a stipend or an amount for every single certificated person um, in order to be able to receive supplies through Palace. And so um, Rich Adiano and his team have done a really fantastic job in that they, they have even created kits that are equaling to 100 $125. So if someone doesn't have the time, they can go in and just um, select that kit. We hope that people take advantage of it. At this point, um, we have only, we still have um, 106000 of the $143,000 um, disposable. So we have, at this point, we only have um, 36,000 of that money has been spent by certificated staff. And so we hope that people do that um, because we want to make sure that everyone can get the supplies that they need. So if you haven't done so, um, it's really easy. Just go in. You can go through the store. You can go online. Um, or you can, um, you can actually do it through stores. So we encourage people to utilize that resource. And thank you very much. All right. So we'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments, our report on standing uh, committee meetings. So this is our opportunity for each of our uh, board members to make a few comments. And um, Trustee Acosta, did you have any comments for tonight? Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to um, take a moment and... Um, acknowledge and um, applaud one of our very own district employees, uh, Barbie Gomez, who works in our transportation department. She had um, recently set out on a goal to raise $10,000 for Teen Challenge in our community and on Sunday closed that um, fundraising effort and wildly, wildly surpassed the 10,000 gold. So I just really wanted to take a moment, acknowledge her and applaud her for that, for all the work she does in our community, um, especially with our youth. It, it is no surprise that she was woman of the year in 2020 um, for our community. So thank you, Barbie Gomez, for what you 
continue to do for our community and our youth and our community specifically. Um, in, next to that, I, I just also want to um, say happy Thanksgiving to all of our families, our um, district employees, community members, and if you are traveling over the holiday, I wish you safe travels. Thank you, Trustee Acosta. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have any comments? It's a heavy board meeting week for me. This is the third board meeting. Was at um, PVPSA yesterday where we discussed mental health needs in our district. They're doing a great job and more money rolling in and so I'm very proud to be on the board there. Um, wishing everybody a very um, happy and safe Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Orozco. Yes, thank you. Good evening everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. I got the opportunity to attend the Veterans Parade um, along with my family um, and part of the ceremony honoring all who served. So thank you so much for your service. I also attended our Green Team Committee meeting. We are making good strides and close to finalizing the student staff community survey to inform our priorities. Uh, we will be meeting again next Monday. Uh, last night, I attended our DLAC meeting. We had a rich discussion on COVID-19 protocols, what we're doing as a district to improve those protocols, uh, truancy and parent participation. I also got the opportunity to attend the Wine and Roses event hosted by uh, the Community Health Trust, and it's just a great event to connect with other elected officials, but also our community partners here um, in the Paro Valley. And lastly, I am looking forward to our Paro Valley Education Foundation meeting in the coming weeks where we'll be uh, reviewing and selecting our recipients of um, this cycle's Bridge to Wellness Fund grants. Um, and again, thank you for joining us tonight and happy Thanksgiving. Trustee Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I too wanna acknowledge all the fellow veterans and my colleagues ex post facto. Um, and wish all the families a happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays, safe travels. Um, also wanna give a shout out to all the local football teams for first round of CCS playoffs. Unfortunately, um, most of them got knocked out first round. Uh, but the current team that is gonna be uh, proceeding on in second round of CCF playoffs is St. Francis High School, so I do wanna give them a personal shout out and. Good luck against Los Altos this Friday evening for second round of playoffs and uh, go Sharks. Thank you. And um, you know, I attended a variety of various community events like our trunk or treat uh, event, you know, at the county fairgrounds for our, our trick or treaters to do so safely. And um, our Aptos Chamber of Commerce event and the, all the wine and roses event. And again, you know, like as Trustee Orozco mentioned, it, it really is, are a wonderful event to really connect with our community partners and you know just build the connections which support our schools. I also attended our uh, special education programs uh, community advisory uh, committee meeting and I was very impressed by the discussion around inclusive practices, you know what um, what our school district offers, the options, and you know the, the how the school community, the entire school community, benefits from these practices. And there was also a great you know resource discussion about different kinds of learning differences for you know parents who attended that meeting. I also want to acknowledge the following donations for our state of the district event. We had you know a really generous uh, food donation, you know for the event, from uh, Guadalajara Bakery, from De La Colmena from Driscoll's and Starbucks. And you know we're continuing to build momentum for our Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen project. And we received a donation from Erica Padilla Chavez for $500, for Rebecca Garcia for $200, from Clint Rucker for $500, and from the Shook family for $250. So thank you uh, all of our uh, community partners and community members for contributing to that. We'll move on to item 3.5, our high school students, uh, our board representatives report, and we have uh, students from Wat Watsonville. Is that? Hi. Yeah. Uh, 
presentation now. Uh, that's FFA's presentation. Thank you for your patience as we get the presentation. There we go. <laughs> Come on. I'm just going to uh, go to approval of the agenda and the minutes while we're getting the technical issue worked out. So give me just a moment. Um, for I, so, do, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve. I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, six zero and uh, one. Um, for item 5.5, 5, approval of the October 27th, uh, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion carries. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. 601. Are we re are we're ready? So back to item 3.5. Almost there. Boom. Let's go. <laughs> Let me just. Hello. Hello. Perfect. Uh, may I begin? All right. Hello, my name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, and once again, I'm the representative from Watsonville High School here to talk about what's happened in Watsonville High School since the last board meeting. Because even though it's only been about two and a half weeks, three weeks, a lot of stuff has happened around campus, starting off with our athletics. Our cross-country team made it to the Division I CCS finals, and 
many, many, many of our really talented runners have made it, uh, have <laughs> ran incredible times. Some notable ones, Rodrigo Barranco, he's a freshman, alongside Caitlin Ruiz, who is also a freshman, coming as some of the fastest people in Watsonville High School. We're very excited to see where they're going to go from here on. And this was probably impossible without the leadership of Cross Country's team captain, JJ Camibio, who's also a senior this year. Uh, going on to the sort of activities and celebrations that have been happening around Watsonville High School, uh, we celebrated on November 2nd, Dia de los Muertos. And this celebration demonstrated uh, works, art pieces, ofrendas that were made by different students around Watsonville High School. And we also brought a bunch of pan dulce and hot chocolate, I believe, and champurrado and gave it out to different uh, people who are just walking by to see all of the art that was made by our lovely students. We also hosted our homecoming dance completely outside, which had a massive attendance of 646 students, and we profited thousands of dollars. <laughs> a ton of people had fun, and it was very successful and uh, I think pretty safe. We also celebrated our homecoming parade with our academies making different floats, each of our different classes creating floats, uh, and our teams being represented, like our football team, our tennis team, our cheer team, and our golf team. We also represented a bunch of different clubs like Mata Club, Hope Club, Saga, uh, Culinary Cats, and FFA. And this week we have our Survivor Week to sort of, it's a bunch of sort of dress out days so that we can participate in something together throughout all of the you know different struggles that we're having from seniors in their college applications to people just trying to get through this uh, th get through the semester and so we have all the different dress out days right there last month we celebrated breast cancer awareness month and we uh, fundraised a lot of money we fundraised over 300 dollars for breast cancer awareness which watson high school is donating i believe and every single wednesday we would wear pink in support of breast cancer awareness we also uh, hosted, I mean, the PVSD hosted this, but it was hosted at Watsonville High School, the lovely Veterans Day Parade and Celebration, where over 25 Watsonville High School students and link leaders uh, sort of part served as ambassadors of Watsonville High School to serve the veterans that we celebrated on Veterans Day. Alongside that, Drama Department's Fall Play, The Love of Three Oranges, is, is being hosted now on the weekends. It's at I believe the times are 1.30, and the next two times are November 20th and November 21st, though the rest will be shown uh, during actual class time. And to celebrate our, uh, our frontline classified staff, like security, cafeteria workers, our uh, front office and custodial workers, we're giving out charcuterie boxes to different, uh, all the sort of different people do, that do you know, work at our school. So this is sort of, um, a way of giving back a meal and food to these people and these workers who have helped us so much and who oftentimes miss out on meals and dinners with their families because they're working and contributing their time to Watsonville High School. And so we've gotten tons and tons of donations from Trader Joe's, Cabrillo College Farmers Market, and a bunch of different private donations. So we're really grateful for that as well. Alongside that, French Club, led by Mr. Molanchon, is uh, planning a tour of France that will be occurring in 2023. And this was even featured uh, in an article in Outlook Santa Cruz. Uh, the first fundraiser that they're having is the 29th at Corlitos Padres Hall, which is a sort of night of painting where there will be food, painting, things to take home, and it's $30 a ticket. It's specifically for adults, but it's meant to fundraise for this trip for our students. Academically, We've had tons of students, over 600 students being honored in our honor roll. And each of these students were given a certificate and a cookie donated, not, not donated, but bought from Pacific Cookie Company. Uh, these are for the 10th graders and 12th graders celebrating the uh, hard work and effort of our students from last semester during virtual learning. Uh, and seniors also received a sort of block letter for getting, it says 3.0, 3.0, uh, getting above a 3.0 GPA in their classes last year. Watsonville High School is super, super proud of their students who work very hard during virtual learning, and so this was our sort of way of celebrating them, and our counselors did a great job with this. Seniors are also struggling through our college applications, like I am. <laughs> I'm very scared of writing my PIQs, but a lot of my English teachers and a lot of the teachers that I have have been incredibly supportive. AOP, one of our honestly most amazing programs that we have at Watsonville High School has helped out so much with this and Watsonville High School's counseling team has also helped facilitate this sort of uh, college application process and aid our students in all of that. So those are the things that have been happening in the last three weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. So I'll, op I'll close the meeting and open the public hearing. So we'll move on to 6.1, uh, PVUSD's Sunshine proposal to PVFT for the 2021-2022 school year. The report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Tonight I have in the public, it's public hearing. So tonight we are bringing forth our sunshine proposal to PVFT. We're in reopeners for the 21-22 school year and um, we are sunshining the health and welfare um, article to go along with the total compensation so we can negotiate um, with PVFT. We have four dates already identified so we're looking forward to being able to work collaboratively with PVFT um, for the 21-22 school year. All right. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do, we have nine total. So I'm gonna be calling um, by threes. Uh, so just make sure to line up as your name is being called, please. So we have Sandino Gomez, followed by Lewis Sampson, followed by Travis Walker. Uh, and each speaker will have two minutes um, to make their comments. Sure, we have Sandino Gomez. Lewis Sampson, followed by Travis Walker. How long do you have? Great. Um, good evening, PBSD School Board. My name is Sandino Gomez. I've been a longtime community member. Um, yeah, and uh, now currently a teacher at Pajaro Valley High School. I'm proud of the work I do there. I'm really stoked on the you know, being able to serve my students and to give back to my community that has given me so much. And I just hope that as we start these contract negotiations, you can find it in your heart to, to give a little bit back to us. Because I think I can speak for most of the teachers in this room when I say we are drowning in the responsibilities we're being asked to pick up on because unfortunately the school board is not providing our students what they need to succeed. I tell my students every year that there's a recipe for success, and it involves showing up, doing hard work, having quality teachers, having quality facilities equals success, right? It's a formula. You need to put all of the pieces of the equation into the formula in order for it to work. Last we checked, as of my understanding, we have nine vacancies at my high school. We are constantly being asked to pick up the slack and make up for this. But I can tell you that despite our best efforts, it's not enough. And Students are feeling the impact. Yes, it's impacting teachers, but if it impacts teachers, it means it impacts our students as well. And they're struggling. I did an experiment in my classroom where I asked students to raise their hand if they had at least one class where they've had a permanent sub and not a, a teacher of record, not a permanent person that can build a relationship and build a rapport and create quality learning. In every single class I teach, at least half the class raised their hand saying I have one class or more. In one class, there was three students who had three teachers missing. <laughs> that's, a, that's just wrong. It's a violation of the Williams suit. It goes against common decency and it's just insulting for all the hard work and the, 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 the education, the training, the professional development, and the things that we put into this job, which is our heart, our soul, and every single ounce of our fiber and being. Time. I learned something really disturbing. I'll just end with this. It wouldn't be a bad idea for me to quit and go start working at Panda Express because they basically pay exactly what you pay a brand new teacher for being an assistant manager. Now, if you get into the general that manager position, Thank you. you need 12 years of education, or excuse me, 12 years of work in this district and 45 units of continuing education Thank you. to make what a general manager at Panda Express makes. That's a disgrace. Please, please do better. Our students deserve it. I just want to remind the public that we do have to stick to our two minutes. So let's just be respectful of that time. We want to make sure that we have the time to listen to everyone who's present here tonight. Uh, good evening, okay. Lewis Sampson. Uh, I teach middle school at EA Hall. And I want to piggyback on what the gentleman just said. Uh, we're just not paid enough. 
at our school, every year we lose gifted teachers to Morgan Hill and places like that. Uh, I've, so I've seen ads on TV, us trying to petition for teachers to come, but we're competing with other groups that pay so much more money. Now, I'm going to get dramatic. I teach language arts. All of us, just quiet right now. Imagine for a minute what it would be like if the teachers go on strike. That's heartbreaking. Just the thought of it. For you students, teachers, parents, let's just stop for a moment. And so I'm, sa I'm doing this because hopefully you'll be generous in these negotiations and do the best you can to, to, to make sure that doesn't happen. So I'm going to count uh, 20 seconds. Just imagine. We're all on strike. My God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. There we go. Um, so I've been here for weeks talking about some of the issues that we're seeing. So I'll move past that and I'll talk about actual negotiations. Um, was it last week, the week before, uh, we had uh, Daniel Dodge Jr. Uh, come to Watsonville High School uh, and I was able to speak with him. And one of the things we spoke about and one of the comments he made was, uh, we were talking about what needs to happen with the salary in order to attract teachers here, retain teachers here. And one of the things that he mentioned uh, in that conversation was, well, what are teachers doing? Uh, and he also mentioned that, well, board members aren't on the negotiating team, so what can we really do? Uh, so I want to address both of those things. <laughs> I'm hoping they were genuine ignorance and not a way to deflect questions, but in case they were genuine inquiries, here are some of the answers to that. Uh, teachers at Watsonville High School have been meeting every week at lunch, four weeks now. Um, we have sent you all letters. Uh, we have done flyering before school. We've done <laughs> picketing. Um, we, uh, some teachers at, uh, I believe, PV, just filed Williams Act complaints um, to try to get somebody to do something. Um, we are doing everything that we can uh, so let's address what you all can do. Um, despite maybe genuinely ignorantly portraying uh, the board as powerless in negotiations, anything that comes out of those negotiations has to be approved by you. Meaning you can not approve it if you don't like the number they come back with. Now I know when you hear that you might think <laughs> the number being too high, but I'm meaning the number too low. I want you to really think about the fact that the teacher shortage we're experiencing here and have been experiencing is now being exacerbated by a national teacher shortage. There simply are not enough teachers coming in to fill the need. So you're going to have to actually compete and not just be close enough that you can say, oh, we're comparable, but pay well enough that you can actually attract teachers here over other districts. Time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Chris Webb, followed by Ryan Olivas, followed by Greg Inker. I'm sorry, I can't read the handwriting. Tucker, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for this uh, prompt, Sunshine. I hope for a quick agreement that makes attracting and retaining teachers for our students a priority. I noticed there was a, a desire to open the health and welfare uh, article, and it's a little disconcerting because I feel like cutting benefits or in any way um, undermining them would be a detriment to the goal of attracting and retaining teachers. And also we had that recent board meeting that shows that we're actually in a good spot in terms of having an economical and uh, a good plan for the teachers. So that, that's concerning. Instead of opening that article, I think it would be better for the district to open the leaves article and then add an enhanced pregnancy leave wherein for every year of service, a teacher who has a child or is partnered with one would get a, a week of paid family leave. That might be a way you could attract and retain teachers. 
And number one, to attract and retain teachers, we do need the, the, the wages to go up. And I, I feel like the, the PBSD needs to remember that last time we did the negotiations thing, we, the teachers were insulted. They were disrespected by the 1% contingent on attendance. This really bothers me because that, thanks to some of the, the new initiatives um, that were brought out at my school, a model, um, we, our attendance rate's actually gone down. So through no fault of my own, we, our attendance rates are diminished. And I would, uh, the other thing about, I don't drive the kids, but there's a couple times where I might, and that might be a field trip, but I heard that now I can't even do that. So I definitely think if we're gonna be attracting teachers, and if we value quality education, which means not having constant subs, not having um, teachers have to take on additional burdens, if we care about public safety, for those multiple reasons, we need to be raising wages. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan Olivas. I'm a teacher at PV High in special education. I've been teaching for 20 years. I've been four years in this district and I love it here. I love my students, I love my community, I love my colleagues. Uh, what are teachers doing this year? I've seen teachers do extraordinary work this year, uh, rising above challenges, supporting each other, covering each other's um, classes during preps, trying to imbue a sense of normalcy for our students so they can come back uh, to a supportive community. Uh, this is not normal, this is, this is abnormal, the situation um, that we're in right now. Each year I've been here, uh, we've lost teachers. And in my department, we've lost uh, at least one teacher every year. They're not moving. They're moving to different districts around the area. They're moving to, they're, mo they're working in Salinas, they're working in PG, uh, they're working over the hill. They like living here. They can't afford to work here. They're looking for a better opportunity. They love the community. Again, they can't afford to keep working here. Please, please strive to match the local area compensation so that we can keep the talent that we still have. We have extraordinary teachers in this, in this district. In my school, I've, I've seen some of the best teaching I've ever seen, and they're burnt out. They're, they're on the verge of quitting. I've, I've, I've had some of my most, um, uh, the teachers that I have the most admiration for at, the, at their limit, and they're, they can't give anymore. We've, we've given and given and given and given, and now it's time for uh, you guys to give some back. Thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, everyone else in the room, hey, hope you guys are having a good night. Um, I've been through a few negotiation cycles now. I've been on the negotiations team for, uh, I don't know, six years or so. Um, and, and I really just am hoping that the district comes correct this time, quite honestly. Not playing a lot of games, not, oh, there's money. It doesn't have to go to the general fund. It can go straight to teacher's pockets. There is a 5% plus COLA this year. It should probably go straight to the salary scale. Um, it needs to be figured out, quite honestly. If we're looking at news nationwide, the state of Indiana has instituted a $40,000 starting teacher salary. All right? We pay more than that for a starting teacher salary here. But a house in Indiana costs $264,000 average. And a house here is, um, I'm just going to use the round number of a million dollars. So if you multiply that 2,500 by four, then a starting teacher salary here should equate to 160 grand. We're not asking for that. We're just asking for enough pay that we can actually afford to eat, All right? Okay, next we have Amy Fitzgerald, followed by Brandon Denise and Rebecca Morrison. 
Good evening. Thank you guys for giving me the chance to address you. Um, similar to what some of my colleagues said, I work with the most amazing people every day. I show up to a job I'm passionate about. I see kids that run up and draw us pictures and thank us for being there. And it's very fulfilling. It's very rewarding. But I also see the young and the new teachers leaving. And we get bonded. Our, our coworkers are the people that keep us standing up. They are the people that we lean on and rely on. It's not the admin, it's our coworkers. And when they leave and they go elsewhere, we're starting over constantly, constantly. There is an old saying, you get what you pay for. And if you want quality teachers, you need to pay for quality teachers. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brandon Denise, Vice President of SELPO with the PVFT and in my seventh year in the district. I want to piggyback off what one of my colleagues mentioned about we should be discussing the article for total compensation and not health and wel welfare. This is pretty much a non-starter. Um, I'm here tonight. I also want to shout out my colleague, Ann Faustina, who's here grading papers tonight because she doesn't have a prep period to do that. Gee, wonder why. Um, so I'm here tonight after losing 12 of my last 22 prep periods due to having to constantly sub on my prep and this district's inability to provide a substitute for a classroom that has been vacant for over a month. We can't even fill the jobs that we know we need a sub. In the past week at my middle school, we have had to have students being supervised in a multi-purpose room, two classes worth, during what should be class time, being supervised by an admin because of this district's inability to staff our schools adequately, which to me sounds like a violation of the Williams Act. How are these issues related to sunshine and contract negotiations? Because it's time for the leadership of this district to stop making excuses, stop blaming the pandemic, and look at our contract with an open mind and clear eyes. Because teachers can't make excuses, and your excuses fall on us. The issue is that you refuse to offer competitive pay in comparison to districts over the hill, and you readily accept the status quo that you have a district full of burned out, underappreciated, and yes, underpaid teachers. Solving the issues that plague this district should start with respecting the contractual rights that are already in place for your labor base and increasing compensation for all those that serve our students of this district, from our bus drivers, to our custodians, to our teachers. The issues that plagued this district took root long before the pandemic, and unless you are prepared to listen to your labor base and offer adequate compensation, then all you can offer is the same stale and spoiled excuses that you have been serving your labor base and this community for years. So my name is Rebecca Borison. I am a third year teacher and uh, before that I was a substitute teacher for PBUSD. I now work at Pajaro Valley High School and I am getting ready to have my first child. I'm getting ready to have my son, Atticus. And today I would specifically like to speak to um, the negotiations. We neighboring districts can offer 20% more in pay. When managers at Panda Express can make more indirect compensations and benefits than a first year teacher? Whose fault is it really that these vacancies, these nine vacancies, are not getting filled? My husband and I have been trying to purchase a home in this county for the last two years, and he's not kidding when he says it starts at a million dollars. We have been renting sharing property with three other individuals. I want to be able to provide a home for my son. I want to know that my students will be okay when I go on leave, that they will have a qualified long-term sub, and that they will not be sitting outside the cafeteria without a teacher, like we've seen time and time again. My question to you is this. I have a t-shirt that says PVUSD Cares sitting on the floor underneath my desk. How can PVUSD look at us and say that they care, look at our students and say that they care without providing teachers fair competitive compensation? Can you really afford to keep losing qualified and beloved teachers and counselors to teacher burnout and better wages elsewhere? Thank you for your time.
Are there any further public comments? There isn't. All right. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Somebody's got a comment. I know. I know. All right. So we're going to go on to item 7.1, our Watsonville High School Future Farmers of America student update. Report will be presented by Natalie Solorio, Angel Lopez, and Vivian Moran, our Watsonville High School Future Farmers of America student leaders. Let's respect our student presentees and give them their, our, our attention, please. Good evening. My name is Angel Lopez, and with me I have Natalie Solorio and Vivian Moran. We are all part of this year's chapter officer team, and we're here today to share with you about our current chapter, our national convention, and our futures for the plan. Who here is familiar with FFA? Okay. Well, FFA is a premier national organization that bases off its foundations of classroom, SAE, and FFA. The classroom part is a general instruction that is intertwined with the teaching of agriculture. SAE, or supervised agriculture experience, is a chance of outside, of outside projects that students partake in to further their future career success, and FFA, which has its own foundations of premier leadership, personal growth, and career success. Um, in our chapter, we have 680 en enrolled members. We have five pathways and five agriculture teachers. We have 25 sections of classes. All classes are co college credit approved. Every school year, our chapter decides on the theme that we base our year off. This year, our theme is Inspire Today, Influence Tomorrow. Our thought behind this is that we want to inspire our members to further influence the, fu the future leaders of tomorrow. So we run on five committees. We have the fundraising committee, which raises money for students for to travel and compete in different competitions, as well as have fun events. Our community service gives back to the community, as, as well as getting our students involved in the community more. The chapter activities to promote student involvement and celebrate them. The SAE committee to promote and help develop cool SAE projects for our students. And the public relations helps pr promote chapter activities and our uh, students' ac achievements. This year we had our first ever national delegate and her name is Colby Galassi. She is one in 49 to be chosen in the California. Um, she has been voted on increasing diversity in FFA, urban agriculture projects and teacher rotation and more. Her quote for this year was, it was the most rewarding and inspiring experience of her life. The national, prof national prof proficiency. So na proficiency awards are given to those students with a supervised agriculture experience, experience project. They can compete in sectional, regional, state, and national level. Pamela Denoso was the first in Watsonville High School history to make top four in the nation in the fruit production category. Now for our future goals. Our future goals are to increase involvement at the chapter level through increasing the participation in chapter events and committees. Another future goal is to improve SAE projects to in the, as an end result to have more sectional, regional, state, and national proficiency winners. And our last goal is to increase involvement in our community. Thank you. Any the question? Yeah. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee Soto, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, Trustee I have a question. Rupert? That was a great presentation, you guys. Thank you for being Thank here you. tonight. I love FFA. So when you were just showing that slide about someone being um, fourth in the nation, and I think I heard you say for food, food production, yes. can you talk a little bit more about that? So yeah, um, we have our SA project, um, and we, what, our goal is to make 
our work get out into the world. So our our student who now is a graduate from high, well, from a high school, um, she had a project and she made it all the way to the national level in competition and um, yeah, she was in the top four for food production. <laughs> she was your shining star? Yes. Yeah. And, w and I know there's different um, categories in FFA, so can you guys each say what, you, what you're doing? Are you raising uh, livestock or, yeah? I'm lambs. Okay, great. Yeah, I was gonna add on to that. There's uh, different categories of CEs. We have entrepreneurship, which is what she said, raising livestock at the school. We have play placement, which is what another student we have. And then there's agri-science, which is a project. So you develop a project and you go and present it for computing. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Soto? Sorry, I'm gonna keep you for a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Uh, you know, as a kid, I grew up on a ranch in Salinas, and uh, there was farming lettuce, broccoli. Uh, there was also cattle out in Chular. We had a cattle ranch. I mean, not me personally, but the, the folks that my dad worked for, and we would always participate on the weekends and brandings and things like that annually. So uh, something uh, that I'm kind of doing on a small scale at my own house. So that's good that you guys are involved in that. And, you know, we're, we're in an area where, you know, agriculture is pretty predominant, whether it's livestock or farming. So... Just to piggyback on Trustee uh, Deserpa's question, you mentioned that you're raising livestock. What What is your area of interest? Well, my SAE also includes raising livestock, not necessarily at school, but at home. Okay. Yeah. And yourself? So my SAE project was taking care of plants, so I did that at home. Okay. It's a little bit of agronomy. or uh, yeah. All right. Good. Good. Thanks. Trustee Orozco? Just want to say that's an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your accomplishments. But I'm also impressed uh, by uh, your forward thinking in that you now have goals to even build upon the success that you have already had. So congratulations on a job well done. And I look forward to another presentation in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Acosta. I, I just want to say that you all look absolutely amazing and spectacular tonight. Yeah. All right. And what a wonderful presentation. So um, FFA, FFA goes really far back for my husband and I. He was in FFA with Watsonville High School um, back in the day, myself um, with my high school. And both of us grew up with a heavy presence of ag in our background, him with his parents, me with both my grandparents, um, which is just the, all that experience has tremendously translated into the career paths and what we do now. So I really hope that for you, right? Agriculture, it's the leading industry in the Tri-County. It's the leading industry in the state of California. So um, a major contribution to our GDP for the state. So um, I just wish you all the best and thank you. Um, for coming tonight and presenting to us. And I just wanted to, just for others, maybe could you elaborate on how the delegate selection is made? Just for others that may not know how that process works. Oh, yeah, well, you have to be a faithful member of FFA, mm -hmm. and Kobe Galassi was one of those. Mm -hmm. And there's, an, there's a, a long application process he has to go through to be able to be a national delegate for the state. And the voting process? Well, the voting process. <laughs> so the voting process. So yeah, she was one in four nine to be chosen. Uh -huh. So she voted on urban agriculture uh, laws, American degree requirements, and more. So through this, she practiced a parliamentary procedure, which is a formal system of passing laws, as you guys are doing now. And that is how. I mean, I can't go into detail. Cause sure. She, a first-hand experience, but she couldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. But that's what I have to say. Thank you. Well, wonderful. And I, I just also wanted to just give another plug um, to um, both Hartnell and CSUMB, who have developed a two-by-two -two program in both agribusiness and agri-science. So what that means is that if you start at Hartnell 
and you stay on the track that you stay on, you're guaranteed two years at Hartnell, two years at CSUMB, whether it's agribusiness or agri-science, to be guaranteed graduate within four years. So I hope you communicate that back to some of your members to look at that program um, between Hartnell and uh, CSUMB. Thank you for you coming all, again. You. you all look spectacular I have again. One. I just have to say that. <laughs> Yeah. And I just want, you know, what would you say to other students who are thinking, oh, you know, maybe, maybe this is something I'm interested in. What would you say to them? I would tell them if they want to step out of their comfort zone, like spread the wings and try new things. Because through FFA we have um, LDEs and CDs. CDs are career development events such as farm power and cutting judging, which is where you test your, you test and you further your future career possibilities. Because in farm power, you work with, with agriculture machinery, so you practice in the, and I identify in parts and troubleshooting what's the, what's the problem with certain engines. And then we also have LDEs, which are leadership development events, which is more on the speaking side, which is prepare public speaking and impromptu, which is where you step up to a panel of judges and talk. Great. And Trustee Shocker, I know you're re remote. Do you have anything you wanted to add? I think that's it then. All right. All right. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to uh, we'll move on to item 7.2, our update on Watsonville Ivy League project. The report will be presented by Ron Sandage and Lorraine Sandoval Vigil. Good evening, members of the Board of Trustees, uh, District Administration, and audience. I do believe that of the members of the board, uh, Kim DeSerpa may be the only one who's familiar from a previous presentation about what the Watsonville Ivy League project is. Have you heard this before? You have. I thought you might be the other one. So. Thank you, Maria. Um, I want to introduce to you Lorraine Sandoval. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit about how the Watsonville Ivy League project got started. And if Herman is still here, he is. He's going to tell you uh, when Lorraine finishes what it's been like as a student in the project. Good evening. Um, yes, the Ivy League project started in 2007 uh, when we had a, a flyer circulated to the high schools uh, to invite from a, high, a, a flyer from the pa Parlier Ivy League project, Martin Mares, uh, trying to uh, recruit students from other schools to come on his Ivy League project. And so um, we found out that uh, they do t they could visit the Ivy League schools and prepare them to go on a tour of the schools. And so I particularly wanted to uh, do the same thing and bring it to Watsonville. Uh, because I, I feel in my heart that we have students who are capable, just as capable as the students on the East Coast to, um, to compete at the level of these elite colleges. And why can't we give them the opportunity to look and see what's out there to prepare for a profession? Um, because I feel deeply that we can do that here, even in Watsonville. So uh, we started the Ivy League project where we take uh, a few students to visit about 10 Ivy League colleges on the East Coast. Uh, the purpose is that you know many of the, our, our past students that have been on the, on the Ivy League tour are now uh, in their professions. I just, rec I just heard from the, one of the students that um, was on our first tour, just passed the bar exam so he can practice law. We have a, one that's a doctor now at San Francisco. Uh, so we have several success stories from our project and why not prepare our students for professions to look at what's beyond that. Because I think that if we can um, enhance their, mobile, their social mobility of them, their families, their friends, we can eventually 
increase and enhance the social mobility of our community itself. And we say that sometimes, well, why, why don't they come back to Watsonville? There aren't any jobs here in Watsonville, but if we build the capacity to be able to have students uh, become professionals and bring that back to Watsonville, it will eventually happen. Thank you. Uh, hi, once again, my name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez. I'm here to speak a little bit about the value that I've gotten out of this program from the sort of student perspective. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the actual selection process and the trip that I was able to go on, even though it wasn't with the program directly. It was organized by uh, one of my friends, JJ Camibio, and his father, Raul Livio. And so the actual selection process and application process very closely mirrored uh, the college application process that I'm going through right now. So in that way, it was like really valuable. So one, there's that sort of like biographical essay that I become f far too acquainted with, and the sort of interview process, which a lot of my friends are actually getting interviews. I have two friends of mine that actually got an interview from Stanford already, and that sort of uh, interview process, the application process, was super valuable in one exposing us to how that sort of works, but also showing that environment and what you, the sort of internal resources that you need to succeed in that environment. Uh, and despite the pandemic essentially canceling the trip for the majority of the people who are accepted into the program uh, in my year, 2019 to 2022, uh, I was still able to go on this trip with, as I mentioned previously, JJ Camibio and his father. And that happened this July and I was, I was able to visit a ton of Ivy Leagues from Yale to Brown to Harvard uh, to Columbia and that sort of really helped in putting into perspective the value of what we have here back at home back in you know Watsonville and our amazing students and our amazing programs and our amazing teachers but also showed the place that me and I know that so many of my peers that go to Watson High School have in these sort of elite prestigious universities and the opportunities that are given to us. Probably my favorite part was seeing Yale and we actually got to meet with one of the students that attends Yale and she spoke at length about the community there, the opportunities there, all of that. The Watson Ivy League project has probably shown me so many of the opportunities that I know that I can reach and I know that people like me, people from low-income families, first-generation students, rightfully deserve. And I'm honestly really, really excited that this group of students are going to be exposed to these sort of universities, uh, maybe not the Ivy League universities in particular, but like these, this sort of level of opportunities and eliteness and that I'm incredibly excited for, the students, for this year. Yesterday, we concluded the interview process for the students that will be going on the next trip, September, third week, next year. In the years that we've been doing this, we've taken over 130 students on this kind of trip. We've had tremendous support. Those of us that have gone as chaperones, and several of them are out here, counselors, uh, we've got parents that want to go. Teachers have, have gone. MESA coordinators. Thank you, Grace Patino. Um, and the students hear firsthand from students, professors, deans, program coordinators at the universities that we visit. We visit 10 colleges or universities in eight days. We've got a pretty good record. There's a legacy going on. We've had students that have ended up matriculating at Boston University, Tufts, Brown, Williams, Cornell, Yale, a lot at Yale, a lot at Brown, Columbia, and we're hoping this next time to get some into Harvard and UPenn, of the colleges that we visit. MIT. Yes, MIT. Good Lord. We have several students who have gone there, including Esther Lomeli, who is one of the very first. So uh, we wouldn't be there if we didn't get tremendous support from parents, community, and 
administration. I'm really glad that Pancho Rodriguez and Elaine Legore could be here tonight to see and hear this. Things that Lorraine Sandoval tells the students that are selected is you miss 100% of the shots that you do not take, that famous Wayne Gretzky quote. Well, Lorraine, we don't want to miss the opportunity that we have tonight. So where are you? Come here. Because otherwise, if we didn't do this, we would miss that shot. This woman started the program, and we're here to honor and recognize her. Okay? <laughs> Now, we have mentioned um, a young man who is now a, a doctor in San Francisco. Lorraine mentioned that. That's Edgar Garcia, Dr. Edgar Garcia. And right now, you're going to get a chance to hear from him, his brother, Cesar, who's in grad school at MIT, and their other brother, Angel, who is at Yale as a freshman. And in the audience tonight, we have their sister and their parents. So we have Elizabeth, Maria, uh, excuse me, Patricia, and Juan Garcia Lopez. Would you please stand? <laughs> so we have a video for everybody to watch, see here. Of the Brothers Garcia. Hi, I'm Cesar. My name is Sanku. And my name is Cesar. We wanted to personally congratulate you, Dr. Sandoval, for this much deserved recognition and thank you for your dedication to the Ivy League project and the Watsonville community. It was through programming like the Watsonville Ivy League project that each of us aspired to attend institutions we are currently at or have since graduated from. We have been able to see how you have transformed the Ivy League project from the first trip I took with the Fresno, Arizona cohort to what it is today. Thanks to you, many of us, including the Garcia Lopez family, have been able to achieve our educational goals. Congratulations once again. We are fortunate that various elected officials throughout the city, the county, and the state are here tonight to make presentations in honor of Lorraine. We're going to begin with uh, the mayor of Watsonville, Jimmy Dutra. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Sandoval, do you want to come up here? Sure. Good evening, everybody. Um, I first want to say I also went to Watsonville High School, Wildcat. Was F in FFA as well, so thank you to all your stu all the students for being here this evening. And one of the lines in here says that you're a consistent champion for advanced education, or education in general, just like all our teachers here tonight too. So they deserve a uh, pay that is going to fit the um, what our lifestyle is here in this county. And so I'm here with you, standing in unity as well. And I I want to say that your you have worked with our students to make sure that they achieve the goals such as this young family the three sons that is something amazing and yeah. you <laughs> i mean the lives you are changing and touching um it can you are community and i'm honored as the mayor of watsonville to recognize you and to say thank you for all that you've done i hope we have you around for many decades more <laughs> right that's a young that's a young 85 right so plenty more years to go but um, you're changing lives, and that's what we need here in this community. And it takes all of us. I know it's such a cliche to say it takes a village, but it really does. And, um, and you're part of that village, so thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, we're good. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I'd like to bring up Greg Caput from the Board of Supervisors. Okay, uh, well, you, you need a bigger room. <laughs> All these people, this is wonderful. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> uh, you remember when I was on the city council? I do. And uh, this was years ago. It was probably about two or three years after you started the program. And, uh, and did we pass the hat around? Please? Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did, <laughs> absolutely. And... Um, I hope I, I, I think I have the pronunciation correct. Honoring the founder of the Watsonville Ivy League project, Lorraine Sandoval V. Hill. That's correct. Okay. Uh, people mispronounce my name a lot. They say kaput or whatever, and uh, that's okay. You get used to it, right? And whereas Lorraine Sandoval V. Hill is a passionate advocate for bringing opportunities for higher education to students in the Watsonville and Pajaro Valley communities. You obtained your uh, bachelor's degree at UCLA, mm -hmm. your master's at Northern Arizona, and a degree in education from Brigham Young University. Yeah, okay, well that, that's quite a difference in those different colleges, right? So you got something from different backgrounds. That's good. And then uh, in 2007, founded the Watsonville Ivy League Project, an organization that supports underrepresented, high achieving students at Watsonville and Pajaro Valley High Schools who are interested in visiting and applying to Ivy League schools. And whereas the Watsonville uh, Ivy League project tours give prospective college students the opportunity to tour Ivy League colleges and universities, you were even a chaperone on their first trip uh, back, I guess, in 2007. Way back. Where did you go then? We went to the visit of the kids to all the Ivy League colleges on the East Coast. We went to eight colleges at the time. Wow. Uh, with the help of volunteers such as high school counselors, administrators, retired teachers, and parents, the Watsonville Ivy League project has opened doors for students all over Santa Cruz County, especially in South County, mm -hmm. and whereas as a scholarship coordinator for Pajaro Valley Unified School District, Lorraine educated students on their financial aid options so that the cost of college would not be an impediment to pursuing their educational goals. Now, that's really important nowadays with the cost of going to college is just uh, skyrocketed. And you've given so much of your time, care and resources the Watsonville Ivy, with the Watsonville Ivy League project. And because of you, the futures of local high school students have been forever changed. And whereas uh, Lorraine is, isn't working, when you aren't working to help students, you enjoy swimming, cooking, music, and spending time with your family. Your two daughters, Julie and uh, Virginia, and your sons, David, Eric, and Beckett, and Skylar. Uh, let's see, how many is that? This one, <laughs> two, four, 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 four six. And you have six. Two wow. Okay. I have five kids. They're all in the Pajaro Valley uh, Unified School. Uh, two, uh, four at uh, Minnie White, uh, two in uh, uh, kindergarten, and two in the fifth grade. And uh, we have our, our boy is in uh, at Watsonville High School. He's a junior. So. Uh, you, it's not, uh, you have enough time to do all that, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, therefore, uh, now therefore, I, Greg Caput, Santa Cruz County 4th District Supervisor, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, honor you, Lorraine Sandoval Vigil, for your hard work and dedication and commitment to the Watsonville Ivy League Project. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.
I just want everybody to know that it doesn't, it, there, it just can't be one person. I relied on a lot of people, uh, the counselors, Jimena, Ospina, and Joel, and uh, uh, Nancy Puente from PV High School, from Watsonville High School, Rochelle Viotti, Jamie uh, Myers, Amanda Sandoval, uh, and Christina McLean, who went, uh, they've all helped out. And of course, Ron Sandich, who does all the planning. He does all of the, uh, the, uh, st the logistics for uh, travel and housing and food and charter bus and Broadway shows and everything like that. So it, it takes a village. It takes everybody. Thank work. you. Representing the state of California, numerous uh, assembly offices, particularly in this case, the office of uh, Robert Rivas, um, we have with us Dominic Duras. Well, good evening, and I assure you, despite being here on behalf of both Assemblymember Rivas, Assemblymember Stone, and Senator Laird, I'm not going three times as long, mm -hmm. so it's okay. Uh, but I just want to share the best wishes uh, of our state delegation, uh, because not only is it important that we have opportunities like this created, that no matter a person's zip code, no matter a person's neighborhood, they have to get the opportunity they deserve to go to university. But it's just as important that those universities have students from places like this. Places like Watsonville, places like Salinas, San Benito, because it's that diversity of experience that goes to a university classroom that truly enriches it. So this is not our permanent uh, mm -hmm. uh, recognition we're bringing. We actually have something, uh, uh, a resolution coming on Friday. So this is just temporary. But I do want to say on behalf of Assemblymember Rivas, Assemblymember Stone, Senator Laird, thank you for ensuring that students really could see beyond the city limits and fulfill their dreams. Thank you. Thank you. We'll you. <laughs> Thank you. From the office of Jimmy Panetta, please welcome Kent Harris Rapass. Good evening. Um, I will be brief. Um, Dr. Zandoval, uh, Congressman Panetta wishes that he could be here this evening. Unfortunately, he's uh, back east. Um, and he asked me to express his great gratitude for all you've done for this community um, and present uh, on his behalf uh, this uh, certificate of special congressional recognition for all you have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. A man named Paul Harris um, was the founder of Rotary Clubs. And in honor of what he does, Rotary presents each year to Rotarians and distinguished members of communities around the country and the world the Paul Harris Award. And so tonight, the Rotary Club of Freedom, of which I'm a member, is pleased to present to Lorraine um, a Paul Harris Fellow. We have a, a great uh, sheet cake over here from Freedom Bakery that has the uh, pennants of the Ivy League colleges. And also, I have with me a box of uh, t-shirts. Each year, the students get a t-shirt that says Watsonville Ivy League uh, on it, project on it. And there's just a few t-shirts left. So anybody in the audience that would like a t-shirt may have one. And anyone that would like to make a donation to the Watsonville Ivy League project may do so. Thank you all very much. And, and, the, and the cake will be served out, out back. Do we have any public speakers to this item? None. All right, do we have any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Lorraine, I'll keep it short. 
but the the amount of lives that have been touched by the program that you started is immeasurable and i uh, you know i just speak on behalf of so many people with love and appreciation for all you've done thank you anyone else and lorraine i just wanted to say i've been hearing about this program since i've been a trustee and it's it's impressive and congratulations yeah and lorraine just really quick um i also want to thank you for um the amazing work through this program. One of the things that I want to highlight that you do is not just expose um, our students here to to the opportunities uh, out there for them, but also you walk them through that process. I know that you've reached out to me multiple times uh, regarding financial aid questions for students and so forth. So, you know, your work doesn't just stop there. It's not just exposing students, but helping them get there and stay there. So thank you so much for um, your work. All right, thank you very much. Oh. Trustee Shockley, did you have anything? Okay. So, uh, I just had one tie up. So um, I know that Lorraine says sorry, that. Uh, oh. Sorry, I'm on a bit of a time delay with you guys, but I just wanted to say thank you for all of your hard work great so I I just wanted to um, sort of commence what everyone has already said and thanking Lorraine um, so and, and I think as Lorraine had already mentioned that you know it sort of is this is one of the situations where she's commending that it really takes a village you know to build the people up but it also takes a tremendous leader so I'd just like to ask if we could give her another standing round of vivation applause for all her wonderful work Thank you so much. We will move on to item 7.3, our annual Williams report. The report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction, and Brian Wall, our Williams monitoring coordinator. Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this evening, I, I worked with uh, Brian Walls to prepare the document. Um, in, over the uh, last couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to present the District uh, Williams um, findings, and this evening you'll hear from Brian Wall and I believe also Richard Reed who will go over the county's uh, final report of the Williams from the inspections throughout this fall semester. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brian Wall from the County Office of Education. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, I just really want to commend Lisa and her team for just being so awesome and cooperative in this process. Because I know it's not really a fun process to, to begin with. Um, but I also want to commend the sites uh, from the maintenance staff to the instructional staff. Just everything was exemplary. And, um, you know, it really felt good to walk in those classrooms and see, see really good instruction going on and, and, you know, making and knowing that the district has provided, you know, sufficient instructional materials for everybody. So the Williams, you know, the Williams Act, I'm just going to briefly talk about what we look for. So we, we look for sufficient materials, instructional materials, uh, in the core curricular areas. We determine if the, the facility condition, if there's anything that poses an emergency, we need to take care of that right away. We also look at the uh, school accountability, accountability report card, uh, that they're current, which they were. Uh, the uniform complaint policies were uh, all posted in English and Spanish, uh, which they need to be and every school uh, had that, every classroom. 
And then the other uh, aspect, number, number five, is determining if there are any teacher misassignments or vacancies um, at the schools. So you, I think in your packet you probably have uh, a breakdown uh, uh, by school. Um, and so I won't go into each school because that would take a really long time. Uh, but you'll find that uh, basically I, I really have to commend you on your K-8 alignments and uh, that everybody is you know, using the same materials. And at the 912 level, uh, everything is aligned with the standards. Uh, and um, if there were any deficiencies at all, they were dealt with Im immediately, uh, produced purchase orders to show that those things had been dealt with. So I just really commend uh, Lisa again on uh, being so prepared and taking care of business. Um, so I w I I'll, I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions. Do we have any public speakers first? We do. We have a total of four for this item. Okay. So. Have one more presenter, I think. I don't need to oh. uh, Richard is here to answer any facility questions you might have. So I'll let him step forward if you don't have any questions. Uh, he can go over kind of what the facility findings were. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for um, hearing us this evening. I do want to commend Gary, um, Gary Webb, who is the director of facilities for Pajaro. It was wonderful working with him and the MNO team as we inspected all 19 Pajaro schools. Um, this, and I was really, really happy to see the enthusiasm to improve the quality of the schools and the goals that are coming up in the next year and, and in the future. I, I think that Pajaro is headed in the right direction. And we had a really good time visiting all 19 schools, so thank you. Okay. All right. It was a very collegial um, effort, and I really want to thank everybody for uh, doing so. Um, you know, uh, they're going to change the parameters for Williams in the future. And I feel kind of badly for the schools that have to do this year after year after year because it's based on an antiquated API index. And so uh, the governor just signed something, AB 599, which is going to look at the 2019 dashboard and reconfigure the list. So the superintendent of public instruction will come up with a new list, spring of 2022. Some schools will drop off, some schools may stay. Other districts may be more, uh, more involved, and we'll just have to see w what they come up with on the new list. But uh, that's kind of a breath of fresh air as far as, you know, these, four, these same schools being uh, investigated year after year after year. So it should, should improve quite a bit. Hopefully there's some money to follow, too, for some of the, the, the needs you may have, especially in the facility area. Um, any questions? We'll, we'll let the public make their comments first and then we'll ask our, our okay. questions. Sure, so we have uh, Greg Tucker, followed by Micah Powell, and Rebecca Borison. Hi, so um, again, I'm here uh, as a teacher in the district and as a union site rep and um, also as an individual with concern for the fact that we are horribly understaffed and that is one of the issues that is going to be covered in this report according to the agenda that I have. Um, so teacher assignments and misassignments. If, if I had a child attending the site where I am working right now and I went to our district website to try to file a Williams uniform complaint which is what I'm supposed to be able to do, I would find the process um, difficult and frustrating at best. It, at this point, I find it ridiculous that there is not an electronic form that can be filled out electronically accessible on the district site. You have to get the form, print it, and also print instructions as a separate document and then figure out how to do it. That may be in legal compliance, but it is uh, disingenuous. Um, that's one issue. The second issue is the actual lack of teachers at the site, the lack of actual substitutes. And some of that is excusable probably because of the teacher shortage, because of where we are at. But at the last board meeting that I watched, from my home, I heard our assistant superintendent of HR, Ms. Nazawa, say that there were no Williams complaints. 
which is likely true if none were filed, but the process to file them is complex and overwhelming, even though it is supposed to be a simple process. All right, good evening, school board. I'm a teacher at PV High School, and I'm here to talk right now because I'm not sure you know this. Uh, many people have said it before, but I'm gonna say it again. We have nine vacancies at my school right now. Uh, I have a few stories that go along with what that's like. Recently, a teacher had to sub on their prep. This happens every day, by the way. Teachers subbing on their prep for a class where there has never been a teacher handing out a worksheet that was given to this teacher. Only two students in the entire class did the assignment. And when the teacher asked, <coughs> is anybody else going to do the work? A student replied, who's going to grade this? Why should we? What's the point? Some of those students, upon further conversation, told that teacher that three of their classes, half of their schedule, there was no teacher. While trying to patrol, uh, manage the hallways where there are students wandering the hallways, I've oftentimes stopped students and said, can you please go to class? Here's a quote that I've heard oftentimes. I don't have a class, I have a sub. Every day we have students attending class in the cafeteria. I'm a 15 year veteran in this school district and I just wanna point out that the um, upcoming negotiations on our contract is very much intertwined with this issue. My housing costs have gone up $1,000 per month since we got our last contract approved. I'm a 15 year veteran. Imagine what it's like for a, a first year teacher or a, br a brand new hire. And you can understand why we have such a shortage. So please, in these upcoming negotiations, don't drag your feet. Don't give us some terrible offer like what seems to always happen. Time. And feel like it's gonna make a difference because nine vacancies could easily turn to 10, 15, or 20. And that's not doing our service. That's Thank not you. serving our students. Thank you. So Rebecca, just give me one second. So um, the next speaker we have is Sandino Gomez. No, Rebecca, you can go um, <laughs> after you. I'm sorry. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, so I'm here again to speak about the nine vacancies uh, as well as um, some of the issues we've had with uh, the security and monitoring students and access to bathrooms and bathroom facilities. With nine vacancies and limited and closed bathroom facilities, students are exhibiting escalating behaviors and undergoing mental health crises that are unprecedented, at least during my time in this district. Without adequate staffing, it is our students who lose out, but the effects are also felt by the teachers who show up every day. Many teachers can count on one hand how many days they have actually been able to use their prep to plan and grade, and there are still not enough staff and substitutes but grades still need to be submitted, lessons still need to be planned, and assignments still need to be graded. When are we supposed to complete these tasks? We definitely are getting compensated for the days that we are up till midnight grading and leaving feedback. Teachers are burning the candle at both ends and still the inequities persist. Then you have the bathrooms and lack of access to clean functional facilities. Students have come to me asking if they will get in trouble if they go on the field because they can't possibly hold it any longer due to how long the lines are. Students talk about how they can't wash their hands because someone has urinated in the dispensers, leaving them without soap. These are only some examples of the Williams Act violations witnessed at my site and the reper repercussions continue to be felt. Thank you for your time. Those are all the speakers for this item. Good one more, right? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. That's all good. I'll just bring this up here as a friendly reminder. Uh, I'm also grading while I'm listening to this commentary, so 
Shout out to the person who gave me the idea to do some grading. Um, our site is full of Williams Act violations, plain and simple. You can adjust numbers, you can assign TOSAs, you can have people sub on their preps, but the bottom line is we don't have what we need to be successful, and we're not providing our students what they need to be successful. As a young student, I was really troubled, and I had a lot of problems, and I can point to this man right here, Brian Wall, and say that I'm here today because of him. Junior Assistant Principals Club, shout out. I've had students tell me that, you know, I'm trying to encourage them to succeed, and they're telling me, why should I take this seriously when it seems like my school doesn't? If my school took this education seriously, we would be adequately staffed. I wouldn't have three substitute teachers instead of people that I can build a relationship with and that can connect with me and help me in my time of crisis. I've had students come up to me telling me they were suicidal, that they felt like they couldn't go on, that this wasn't worth the stress, that it's, they, they don't feel school is like a place that helps them. This is reflected in the conditions that they find themselves in as well as the staffing that we're providing them. Students are wandering the halls because why sit in a class with a sub who's not going to teach you anything and bother to like invest in you? We're not investing in the people who invest in our children. I won't go over time, I promise. Thank you for the warning this time. I didn't see it last time. PVUSD, please do better. Please, we're begging you. We've been begging you. This is not a new issue. This is not pandemic related. These issues have been around for a long time. And I'd also encourage you as you look at the facilities and the adequacy of our facilities to look at what Watsonville and Aptos High has that PV High does not. Because there are lots of things I could just name off the top of my head. Like a swimming pool, like an auto body or wood shop or metal shop. Like Thank a you. theater, a theater for dramatic performances. Drama was a huge part of my high school educational career. We don't have those things that the other schools have and we deserve them. Thank you. <laughs> do, we have any dis do we have any discussion from the board? I have one question. Um, no further? Okay. Um, Lisa, I, I had one question for you, and I, this I think it's for you, but Brian, it might be for you as well. Um, but in, in some of the reports, I saw comments like, you know, excessive paper or, you know, that was fire hazard or items stored on top of cabinets that could be, you know, like an earthquake hazard. What, how are those issues being addressed? President Holm, I can handle that one. Um, Gary can elaborate if we need to, but we uh, we did address some of those already. Our maintenance and operation team is aware of those. We actually had... Um, hold, on, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing the discussion over the comments that's happening in the audience. Can we please keep our side discussions down? Thank you. So we had... Um, both uh, Aloni and Minty, they actually, principals were already on it, removed a lot of those papers, removed a lot of those books that were on top of cabinets and files. Um, so they are working on it, and our maintenance and operation team, as he walked, uh, Gary walked the site with Richard Reed, they were already identifying fixes and working with the team to get it fixed. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Item 7.4, uh, district requirement to redraw trustee areas. The report will be presented by Clint Rucker, our CBO, and Ron Van Orden, Power School. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So education code requires that every 10 years, we actually uh, reevaluate our trustee area boundaries based on census data that's released typically in September. Last time we did this was in uh, 2011, so it has been 10 years. We're back to, once again, reviewing those uh, boundary areas. Each year we, um, we have to look at the boundaries and see if any two trustee areas vary by more than 10%. So what that means is if one has 105% of the population, the other has 94%, that would be an 11% difference. Therefore, we would have to actually redraw those boundaries or really adjust those boundaries. So one thing I do want to make clear, this is um, not like a, t uh, this is not a brand new redrawing of boundaries. This is simply adjusting boundaries to be more in line with um, 
with AGCO, with state law and federal law. I'm not going to go too much into the process. I'll let Ron do that. I do want to just briefly talk about our timeline. We are currently at the November 17th board meeting. We'll be discussing it um, briefly here. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be sending out a survey to actually all of our community members, letting them know if they have any uh, any sort of um, insight on how what they would like to see with the boundaries, any um, recommendations for Power School to do as they look at our boundaries. Again, there's a lot of laws that they need to follow and qualifications they must meet. But in case there's just certain uh, criteria that we have concerns from the community, we can always take that into account before drawing, redrawing those boundaries. We'll close that survey around December 7th or so and then send those results to Power School to review so they can draw those maps. We'll come back at the first meeting in January to show those maps. And then once again, do another survey to kind of have community vote on if, there's a multi if there are multiple options of maps, how we could redraw those boundaries. Um, we'll take votes on that. So I am going to pass it off to uh, Ron Van Orden. He is here from Power School. Power School is a third party, um, they're an independent demographer who actually does our uh, demographics for all of our student enrollment projections as well. So this is a business they're quite familiar with and actually 10 years ago when they were Decision Insight, they did help with our original um, redrawing of our district boundaries. So I'm going to leave it to Ron to give you guys just a quick update of what they do and kind of their process. So Ron? Uh, Board of Trustees, district staff, uh, teachers and parents, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come tonight. Um, Clint gave you a great introduction. Um, I'm here to just add to that a little bit about the background and what we do, the data we use. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep my comments intentionally broad. Of course, if there are questions, I'm uh, more than happy to answer those at the end and go into more detail if needed. Um, Clint gave you a really good background. And uh, do I just hit this to advance? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the, the reason this is triggered is we've had a U.S. Uh, census, a decennial census, and then we have the new data in terms of population. And uh, so we've already completed the analysis of your existing trustee areas, and I'll show you some data around that in just a moment. Um, one thing I do want to mention is this is specific to the trustee voting areas. Having done a lot of these with our, uh, we work with about 100 districts in the state. Um, People hear boundaries, they think schools. This is purely for the areas that trustees are elected from. So it has no impact on students and the uh, schools they attend. All right, so there's some broad um, information. You have to, uh, trustees have to be reside in their area, be elected from that area. Um, some background on the uh, elections. This is the uh, part that Clint uh, mentioned. So. The, the idea behind the representation is that not one area is going to represent a disproportional amount of the population. And I'll have some data on that in just a moment. I think Clint mentioned most of these. Uh, so we will go to. So this is the area I wanted to highlight. Um, what we're going for here with the potential adjustment process is they want us to balance the areas in terms of population at, and the, ter the phraseology is as nearly equal in population as possible. So there is some room, you can't hit an exact number, but um, that is the, uh, the goal behind this. So the idea is n nearly equal number of inhabitants. I should mention this, has, um, this is total population, so it, it does not matter whether that person uh, has any affiliation with the district. They had, could go to a different, uh, different school or what have you. Um, we have to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, and I can mention a little bit about that more in detail if needed. They want the boundaries to be compact and contiguous. So we don't want to break boundaries into islands and have, uh, they want them one and they want them to be geographically compact. We can take into account municipal boundary and the location of schools. So a little bit around how we do this. <coughs> you can see here are the existing areas. And we have it in our platform, which is digitized. The US Census provides us the data in what are called census block groups, which are small geographic units, typically the size of a neighborhood, uh, anywhere from two to 500 persons. So really, th it's a pretty straightforward analysis. All of the census block groups inside an area are aggregated up to get a total population uh, for each area. What you're seeing here is the result of that. 
and I'll just direct you to the 2010. So we have the data from the US Census in 2010, and then we have the 2020 uh, data. And that represents the change in those persons. So Clint was mentioning the uh, areas and that, that percent threshold. So you have a compliance range and that I want to just uh, point out that ideal number, 15,865. So that is if we took the total population of the entire district geographic boundary and divided by seven, that number would be 15,865. So then you have your areas in 2020, some are above and some are below. So that is where that threshold is triggered, where you have some growth in certain areas, you have some uh, decrease in population in others, and you've moved from balance to out of balance. Uh, this is a breakdown of the racial ethnic um, uh, data from the each area, so trustee area one through seven on the bottom. This is uh, important for tr uh, the Voting Rights Act compliance. Uh, and that would be the end of that part of it. So what we would do in the event that we were directed to create new boundaries is we would start first by uh, with the existing area. So I want to make it clear this is not a wipe the uh, map clean and uh, start over. We, the, the mandate is to adjust the existing boundaries only to the degree where we need to bring them into compliance. So it's really a pretty straightforward pr uh, process where we would effectively, if an area was above in population, we would reduce that geographically and we would increase an area that needed to increase in population, we would increase that area geographically. Um, so those are the things we have to hit. We cannot make things that are um, non-contiguous. Like I mentioned, we have to be in compliance with the Voting Rights Act. And then we would uh, obviously be able to take other considerations into account, like location of schools, municipal boundaries, et cetera. So that is a quick overview. Uh, any questions? First, do we have any public speakers to this item? We don't. All right. Any questions or comments from the board? I do, just one. Um, so we do have one of the areas that, that involves two separate counties. So how is that handled? Um, so that is um, really not, a, unless it was, you were specific, specifically directed us to take that into account, uh, that would not be a factor. Uh, we do have other customers, uh, clients that are straddle counties. Um, so that really wouldn't be a major factor. We can uh, try to make that uh, one county specific, but not to the degree if it would push that out of balance. So Got it. So we're just focused primarily on the population. Correct. Based on the sense. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. If I think that's it then. Oh, I uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Go ahead. Nine. 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 Nine.
law is that those are more than a 10% swing, so you need to actually readjust your boundary. By letter of the law, all we really need to do is adjust those two to be more in alignment. Mm -hmm. However, it's not always that simple because we're dealing with census blocks. So from what I've learned from Ron in my time working with him, um, we would be looking at a map that best gets everyone as close to that 100% as possible. But again, that's only as possible as it is moving those census blocks around. So next steps, um, we, so again, we'll be putting out a, a survey tomorrow for our community to provide any feedback of what they would like us to try and consider if possible, if it's within the law to consider while drawing those maps. I will uh, aggregate that data, send it off to PowerSchool. They will then draw us up. Typically, I'm working with Rom. We talked about trying for two or three different maps, trying to have some options of this is the way we can do it. It really depends, again, on those census blocks, how many options we'll be able to get. But we want, we're aiming for at least two or three so that we have some options the board can look at. Then we'll bring it back to the board to review those and then get feedback again from the community. And then I'll bring it back a final time for a vote from the board along with the community feedback we received. All of this has to be done before March 1st of 2022. Um, as if we don't finish it by March 1st of 2022, the county office then gets rights to reassign the areas as they see fit. So I would, like, I'm confused about what the community would even ask of this process. So you guys need to clearly explain that to us and the community, because I'm, I don't, so, so, I don't even know what to ask around So that for stuff. example, a community kind of, to Ron's point, might speak to, I would like to not see us have to have too many people where they're switching schools, or they're switching from um, this large area to this large area. Those would be the types of things. So for example, if you have somebody in trustee area, one that borders two and three they might say we would prefer to keep one around the size it is we really think that's two and three that are we would like to see it's again it's all pieces that we would just want to have community feedback can we do it or not will be kind of based on the letter of the law so again we'll, we'll put out in the survey kind of the different um, requests we're looking for but it's really just to get community feedback and see if there's any concerns they have with this process to make sure that the community is aware of the process and that we are doing an unbiased process where we're having a third party demographer look at the data. Okay, I've got two more questions. So you used to be Decision Insight, but now you have changed your name but the same firm. Uh, as of a year ago, uh, we were acquired by PowerSchool. Um, so Decision Insight is now part of PowerSchool, but we, our group still does okay. the same thing. Because you've you've, you have drawn other boundaries for us in the past. Do you guys still have access to those? Yes. Um, okay, so, great. Yeah, um, I wasn't personally involved. I was with the, the firm then, 10 years ago. Um, actually, my boss, who's now retired, uh, was involved in that process. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, the ones we drew at that time. Okay, thank you. Trustee mm -hmm. Acosta? Um, so, Clint, I think you um, answered a, in part what was a clarifying question for me, even though you're saying that these, these um, two areas triggered this redrawing, um, which could have happened if they both had increased by 5%, correct? I mean, because like you gave the example of one increased by 105 and one decreased by 95, right? It would still, either way, it's a trigger. A 10% change is a 10% no, change. No, a 10% difference between two. So oh, a 10% difference. difference. Yeah, so that's the little bit of clarification that we had to get when we spoke with legal is it's a 10% <sighs> swing effectively. So if one's at 95% and one's at 106, you're 11% apart. So that's where they consider that's too big of a gap between your lowest and your highest. Okay, and then but, and then if you had a third area that came in and brought that number down, would that have not triggered it? No, because you look at the two. The, the, the two, low, okay. Or to Ron's point, if any of them are above 110% or under 90%, even that would always trigger it. Okay, G got that. Um, I think that adds a lot of um, elaboration there. And so, and then looking at this trust area as a, a percentage of ideal. Um, and, and really seeing, I mean, trustee area seven is really way off in comparison to, let's see, trustee area one, right? Um, so when you're talking about that ideal, are you, are, is the goal to try to get everybody at that 100% range? I mean, and, and what sort of percentage are you, I mean, are you considering 93.9% .9 and 103.8%? an ideal differentiation? Are you trying to get those both as close to 100% as possible? So the ideal would be 
would be just that. The, the reason why they allow for some variation is because we are dealing with population and communities. It's not you know, likely that you can exactly hit a number. Sure. So, uh, but the goal would be to have them as nearly balanced in population as possible. So what you would see would be those, you know, it would be like a 100.3 and a 99.7 and something along those lines. And, and yes, we are trying to get to that 15,865 number. But to pull away from, because when I see that 93.9 and 103.8, I'm like, wow. Hmm? I mean, that's a vast difference. So like, definitely that could be brought somehow closer yes, together. Yeah, that, and that, I'm, I'm gonna say, I, exactly. I get it's not gonna necessarily mean they're both gonna be ideally at 100%, but that's a big range difference. Right, and that's exactly it. So you're gonna have, um, uh, to just use general terms, some areas would, would give some populations and some would lose, uh, you know. And, and really <coughs> this has to do with the, the uh, um, rate of growth within certain areas, right? right? So, you know, keep in mind that the total population most likely rose over the 10-year period. Some areas just rose faster, which pushed it up into that 103 and others with 93. So it's not like that area lost people, it just one area may have grown at a faster rate. Right, and, and then, so, and then the other component of it <clears throat> is that so you started with, I think it was what, trustee area five and trustee area. Seven are what triggered. Seven triggered. triggered. Yep. But it's not gonna just affect those two trustee areas to clarify for the public. It's gonna affect all seven trustee areas, right? Potentially, so you could see. I mean, most likely. Yeah, trying to get as close to 100% on all of them as possible. So okay. you could see trustee areas that are close to 100% already. If there's no census block we can really move, they may have to stay at the percentage they're at because there's no feasible way to move some out of that block to another block that would actually balance it out. But again, I, the intent is to move them as close to 100% as possible. Okay, but I'm, there is room for movement in all trustee areas in reality. We, we have, met, we have a, a very good track record of, of being able to get pretty close, yes. Okay, um, I, I mean, because some yeah. are, I mean, you could drive down a street, and I, I know this is for you and Trustee Shocker, I know it's for me and Daniel Dodge Jr. It's like, literally you could say the yellow line in the road. It's like, this side is me, that side's you, this side's Trustee Orozco, that side's Trustee Shocker. So, I mean, clearly there's room for movement, potential movement in all areas, right? Um, so, and, and I wanted to go to the next slide with the um, race and ethnicity groups. Yeah, that one. So what consideration do we put also into this, into trying to create balance with race and ethnicity? So largely in this process, this is not an effort to balance um, racial and ethnicities across a, a district. Uh -huh. This really, what this affects is the Voting Rights Act where we are not allowed to modify a boundary or create a boundary which would um, diminish the voting power of what is historically a protected group. So the way I would um, just randomly picking, you know, trustee area three, which you have an 82.8% Hispanic Latino. Right. If we were to draw an area that would effectively split that and make it 40, 40, 40 roughly, that would potentially be viewed as a Voting Rights Act violation because it could be perceived that that is done in a manner to reduce their voting power, Okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. I just wanted to make sure that we had the, the clarification mm -hmm. on that and that when it comes back to the board, if we could have this to see the, what yes. sort of shift we end oh, up with yes. in, in that. and. You know, the only other thing that's sad to say is for those who didn't reply to the census and they're not being accounted for in here, I just have to give the plug for that. That's, you know, a crying shame because, I mean, but that is what it is, unfortunately. So remember, um, what would it be, 2030? Do your census. <laughs> Thank you. Trustee Soto, did you want to say something or are you good? No, okay. And just as a reminder, cards need to be submitted before the agenda item starts. 
Um, so if they're submitted after the agenda item starts, they're not going to be read. All right, is there no further comment from the board? We'll move on to item 8.1, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that although the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, we are listening. And do we have any public speakers? We do. We have a total of 11 speakers to this item. We're going to start with Travis Walker, followed by Sean, followed by Rebecca Morrison. Hi there. Um, okay, I want to talk about something, not because I want to be the one to talk about it, but because I don't know that other people will. Um, so, let's do it. Um, let's talk about race in this district. Um, I've been here for a little bit, not very long, but it's very obvious that <laughs> this district does with most of America's relatively segregated, um, with South County being predominantly uh, Hispanic, North County being less so. Um, and henceforth, uh, when this board makes decisions, they need to take both of those populations into account. Um, and <laughs> this board has a track record of not doing so adequately, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I, the first board meeting I attended this year was to talk about SROs where you all presented research that said that bringing back SROs would disproportionately negatively affect students of color and then voted to bring them back anyways because the power black and Aptos wanted it. So I want to bring uh, our focus to that as far as vacancies go. At the high school level, Paro Valley Unif er, Paro PV High is 89% Hispanic. Uh, Watsonville High School is almost 95% Hispanic, uh, while Aptos High School is 90% white. Aptos High School has one teacher vacancy. PV High School has eight or nine. Watsonville High School has eight. How do those numbers not bother you? How does hearing that not bother you? You are consistently failing to meet not only our students' needs, but particularly our students of color's needs. Just like <laughs> blatantly, knowingly doing so. It doesn't take, I didn't do any type of research. It took me two seconds to Google to see that there was that discrepancy there. It took me two seconds to Google. Did any of you think to Google that? <laughs> to look it up? I'm time. sure you know that information. That's time. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to give you a 30 second warning. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's Sean. Um, I just have a couple questions for you guys. Uh, it's come to my attention through the CARES Act and the COVID Relief 1, 2, and 3 that this school district has received $76,840,000 in COVID relief since 2020. That is $4,475 per student. Where's that money? What are you guys doing with it? I mean, I'm sure there's some teachers that would like to share a little of that. Um, I'm just curious, where is that $76 million being spent? Is there anything you guys can put out that kind of shows the community, the people you represent, where that money goes? Because I'm interested, and I'm sure everyone here is interested, where the $77 million is. I know at my son's school, you guys put up a sunshade. And the last time I checked, that's not $76 million. So just curious where that money's at. And I, like I say, I'm pretty sure the teachers that are still sticking around would really be interested to know where that money's at. Uh, my second question is regarding the masks again. Um, maybe since you guys represent us, it would be a good idea for you guys to put a survey out and ask parents, teachers, and people involved, do they want to wear a mask or do they don't? Maybe you know that would be the best way to do it because you guys don't seem to care about the health of the kids. You seem to care more about making sure you receive that relief money and follow the guidelines to receive it. I don't care about that money. I care about the, the teachers and the students. I don't, I don't care about the money. So I'm just curious if you guys would be interested in maybe asking the people you represent, where do you stand on this position? 
and also maybe asking the people you represent, where do you stand on the position of vaccine mandates? That way, when that comes down the pipe, you guys are well equipped to represent your people. Seems like it's pretty obvious to me. Hopefully you guys can do that. And uh, I'd also like to say again, like I said last time, the screen time is ridiculous. He gets more screen time at school than he's allowed at home. That's unacceptable to me. He doesn't need that much screen time. Maybe when you guys put out your survey, you could also ask if we mandate who's going to pull their kids from school because maybe that would affect your funding as well. $76 million. So you guys already know, but my name is Rebecca Borison and I'm a teacher at Pajaro Valley High School. I've known I wanted to work here since I was a substitute teacher, barely scraping by to make ends meet four years ago when I fell in love with this community and the students. I decided to become a teacher after my 17-year-old brother died from suicide while he was a student in this district. Integrating standards-based curriculum developed during my time on the Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board into my English classroom has been by far my proudest accomplishment and I truly believe I have been able to make an impact. This year, the effects of the teacher shortage on students' mental and behavioral health has been clear. To date, I've had students hospitalized for suicide attempts. I have submitted more referrals for counseling, held more interventions than any other year here as a teacher. They mention, my students mention, how they don't have teachers or grades in some of their core classes. They don't feel like the school cares about them. That they have a substitute teacher after substitute teacher and some days not even that. Student defiance and lack of respect for their teachers and the educational institution has also gotten worse with students blatantly thumbing their nose at their teachers and substitutes by walking out of classes, refusing to participate, lighting fires, literal fires, participating in fights, and even questioning why they should care or be there. We can't begin to adequately address the mental and behavioral needs of our students while simultaneously battling heavy teacher shortages and lack of substitute teachers. Something needs to change. These students need to feel and believe that PVUSD cares not just be given lip service. I truly worry about what is going to happen when I go out on leave. The relationships that I have made, the bonds that I have with my students, when they are passed off from substitute teacher to substitute teacher and they no longer have that structure. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so so uh, next we have Elder F. Marilyn Garrett, followed by Chris Webb. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, wow, I um, can't say I am shocked to hear that $76 million figure um, that this district has received in COVID grant money and it's sad to see that it's not being spent where it needs to be spent. It's sad to see that it's not being spent on the teachers who deserve it. Um, I know one thing that could help with you guys having a bigger pool of teachers, and that's getting rid of masking and vaccine requirements and making sure that that is clear to prospective candidates. Um, I've heard people on school boards in this county and the uh, Board, of uh, Board of Education of the county, including Dr. Sabah, say that it's not your all choice to make that you're just following guidance from the county but that's clearly not true and I don't know if you've been keeping up with recent court decisions but there was a decision recently out of the Superior Court of California in San Diego let them breathe at all versus Newsom at all that clearly states the judge clearly states school districts are not required to impose mask or vaccine mandates whatsoever school districts may elect to do that but it is of their choosing um, there are at least four school districts in this state that are not that are choosing to not implement masking or vaccine mandates, including Mark Twain Union School District and Angels Camp, Calaveras Unified School District, Happy Valley Unified School District out of Shasta County, and Stanislaw and uh, Stanislaw uh, County Unified. So, you all are empowered to make more decisions than you claim, and 
you know, I, the people of this county are watching it, what you do, and um, please get rid of this. It's not for for a board that talks about things like mental health and inclusion policies. It's sad to see that we're implementing a state of medical apartheid here in this county. So you are dividing, clearly choosing to divide this county into two different groups when it clearly doesn't need to happen, especially in this day and age. Time. Thank, Thank you. you. Medical freedom is a human right. First and foremost, mandatory vaccine laws are a violation of the basic human right to voluntary consent without coercion to any and all medical procedures, tests, experiments, and preventative measures. The Nuremberg Code was established following World War II based on the fact that all medical products have an inherent health risk and serious side effects, vaccines included. This is one of the factors I know that you're losing teachers. And to elaborate more on this topic is a new book, just got it yesterday, and I recommend it you all get a copy and read it. It's titled The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Children's Health Defense. And I think this global war on democracy and public health includes a war on our public schools and a total undermining of public schools and public services. Michael Parenti says of democracy, and we're told we live in a democracy. Democracy isn't faith or trust. The essence of democracy is distrust, it's accountability, it's exposure, it's challenge, it's debate. That's what it's about. And I think this applies to science too. Time. Thank so, you. Please check out this new book, The Real Anthony Fauci. Thank you. Um, I want to thank PBSD for providing teacher supplies in the form of credit to use at Palace. In previous years, we've been able to physically go to Palace to use this. I feel that that flexibility should be restored. And um, also that teachers should be able to uh, purchase food items. In recent months, I've seen, noticed that diabetes was a concern with some of my students. And as an emergency measure, maybe it's good to have candy on hand. Also, um, I do have some files or some, some papers on top of my filing cabinet I didn't know was an issue. But if I had more time to file, I could, I could handle that. In the meantime, my regular work, too busy for, for filing for the most part. Um, I also, I'm starting family leave this week, and it's not without some trepidation. Um, partly because, you know, we had our system, our successful student progress monitoring system taken away, and the last time that this happened, we had this, with this other administrator who let himself be misled by some people in this district office. Um, we had five students have to leave site um, due to non-fatal overdoses. When I came back, I had veteran teachers ready to quit because of the campus culture that had deteriorated. I had two separate students feel so empowered that they um, were trying to intimidate me. One of them was on the basis of the color of my shirt that day. And I, I'm nervous. I'm nervous because we have a lot of new teachers. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that if, if something like that is to happen again, that we have an re emergency reinstatement of our successful program, and also that um, under no that we don't have SROs. I don't want to come back if there is something crazy. I don't want to come back to SROs. That's not the reason that we're having this deterioration. I feel like um, 
one example of that, like recently, in the last couple weeks, we had one student who would have been identified and corrected before to be supported. Time. She, she deteriorated, she left, again, emergency facility, emergency services. So, thank you. Next, we have Kathy Butler, James Ewing Whitman, and Gary Arnold. Good evening. Um, I am a community member. I am a parent to a student that graduated from our district. I'm also a former student myself of this district. I've been an educator for over 20 years in our district. And here we meet again. If PVUSD truly cares, like your sign, like your words, if you care about our students, our teachers, and our community, you will increase our salaries. We have already lost too many talented teachers to early retirement and to neighboring districts who pay more. I have a friend who's making $20,000 more a year after she takes in consideration the benefits. This national, sword, this natu national teacher shortage is a crisis and it is only going to get worse. The districts who pay teachers will get teachers to stay. If PVUSD truly cares, show it. Actions speak louder than words. Through this pandemic, we have all had time to reevaluate our priorities. You must now prioritize our students by prioritizing their teachers. Dr. Rodriguez, cabinet, board members, you can do better. You can do better this time around and our community deserves it. Oh, I'm not saying good morning. I was at a school board meeting earlier. I spoke twice at the supervisor's meeting yesterday. Finally had the conversation I wanted to have with Greg Caput outside. I've spoken in front of him more than 100 times. I can't believe all the love that were shared by the people who spoke behind me. Oscar, thank you for being real. You're the only one on this side that's really being real. Um, you know, what do I know? I became an Eagle Scout in 1985. The sickest I ever was when I was living in Japan in 1986 at a temperature of 105.7. Human body temperature above 100, uh, up to 103 is totally normal. I've taken about 500 hot yoga classes, I highly recommend it. I'm certified to teach it. So, you know, what no one else is really talking about, which is not true because two people did talk about it, is what's going on with these vaccines. So the fraud in the United States was basically started by the Biological Control Act of 1902 that established germ versus terrain theory. The human beings have over 300,000 different exosomes that when your bacteria can't take care of it, these things come out. They replicate, excuse me, a thousand times faster than bacteria. Um, there's a lot of healing that can be done with whole foods. My mother's birthday is November 13th in 1986. Anthony Fossey, Fauci, Fakey, whatever, strong-armed Ronald Reagan to sign the first indemnification for for vaccines. Before that, the, those companies were going broke with the 13 they were producing. Now they're doing between 72 and 84. The Patriot Act 2005 provided more indemnity. I only have a few seconds, but you know what? There's a lot of people talking about that the only consistency about these shots is making people sick and genocide. And I'm not hearing any of you guys supporting that. And it's really sad. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where Gary is. Can I take his time? He's my right home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm going to try to find 
All right, Donna Lefevre, uh, followed by Sandino Gomez. And we'll wait for Gary. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Donna Lefevre. I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. I just wanted to take a minute to share about some of the experiences I've had. Um, but I think I also wanted to just build off of um, the presentation that we just saw where we're talking about changing zones and having to look at these different graphs and break down how um, the different percentage, the difference between the percentages, like how complicated it can get when you're trying to understand mathematics. And as a teacher, I'm experiencing that all the time when I'm working with 35 students who don't get to ask questions as directly as we got to um, this evening to understand what we're seeing. So I think that's something we really need to take into consideration, how hard it is for some of the things we're asking the kids to learn. And then we're given, they're given one teacher for 35 of them. And I mean, when the math we were talking about here, you're all very engaged with because it means a lot. It means what your position is. Like you wanna understand these numbers because it has to do with your job. So you're heavily engaged. I mean, I'm working with 14, 15 year old students who aren't necessarily super engaged about the math, but I have to build relationships with them. And I have to work really hard to understand what their knowledge is so that I can build off of what they know. And it's really hard to do that when I have so many students. Um, and to then, this is my first year in PVUSD, but my 10th year teaching, and it's always hard to find math teachers. But then hearing at Watsonville High School how much turnover there's been in the math department, it's really leaving a huge um, disservice and a gap for all the students at our, in our district. Um, and I just wanna share all the hard work that teachers are doing. My mom is a second grade teacher at H.A. Hyde, and she wasn't able to come today because she's in parent conferences right now. Um, she had one that started at seven because she tries to accommodate the families. My sister wanted to be here. She's a special ed teacher at McQuitty. She spoke out about safety concerns at the um, meeting where we had SROs. Time, and she, thank you. She spoke about safety concerns in her classroom. She still doesn't have the support, and there was an incident, a safety incident at McQuitty because she doesn't have that support. So you voted on those SROs to come, but there's no support in the classrooms. We need that right now. Thank you. I'll leave the sign up there this time. I think I made my point. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't agree more about the SROs. I, I was super against that decision. I was watching at home and I literally cried when y'all made that decision. Um, staff our schools. And if we still have discipline problems, if we still have you know, concerns about misbehavior, fine. Police officers are the next logical step. But you are blaming students for our failure by criminalizing them. That is inappropriate, so inappropriate. How much money did you spend on this PVUSD CARES campaign? I think you really do in your hearts, but unfortunately the structure and the institutions are preventing you from doing the right thing. I don't want to personalize this on you, yes people. I know you're all, your hearts are in the right place. But put your minds and your actions in the right place too. Please, we need that. There's an exclamation point at the end of that PVUSD cares. I see a question mark right now. I'm going to redesign that graphic. PVUSD cares, question mark? Prove to us you do, please. When the Williams Act came up and talked about, you know, I, I wish Brian Wall had gone further into the teaching staffing shortage. When they came through and did the inspection of my classroom, I said, yes, I have enough books. My classroom is in fine condition, but we don't have enough teachers at this campus. And he said, yes, we know. We'll talk about that later. I didn't hear it get talked about tonight. Y'all talked to the Future Farmers of America. You talked about redistricting. You talked about everything, having to, everything except things having to do with us as teachers and our students that were teaching. Respond to us, please. Tell us about these things. The last thing I would say is, you know, we have nine vacancies at my school, averaging, let's say, $50,000 a year. That's like half a million dollars. Where is that money going? Where does the money go that is not being paid to a staff, the schools? Eight at Watsonville, nine at our site? That's a million dollars almost. Where are those people? It's frustrating, and I know you have the power to do the right thing. Your negotiators take orders from you, Michelle. You have the power to make this right. You can do this. 
time. There's a lot of money. Please spend it on the people who deserve it and are entitled to it by law. So, last call for Gary Arnold. He's not gonna speak tonight. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to section nine, employee organization comments. So now is when we hear from our employee organizations. So we'll start with PVFD. Good evening. Um, Ms. Holm, your response to the statements provided by teachers sharing their frustration and heartbreak over the impacts of multiple vacancies epitomized how the district receives our input. It also speaks to the lack of care in responding to Mr. B's racist, it makes sense to me now that nobody responded to his racist email to me after I spoke at the August 25th board meeting calling out the vacancy issue as a result of this administration not caring for our students beyond gathering public accolades for the amazing programs that teachers implement. He started with how my comments on teacher vacancies was very impassioned and that yet he was surprised that I thought that 30 openings was excessive with, with most of them being in the South regions. Then he went on about how Mr. Yohiro had pointed out to him over many, many years that young teachers are hired in the South zone. Why? Because the older teachers, are, they move to the North zone and, and then retire. Then they, um, and so then vacancies are backfilled by younger teachers from the south, south zone, zone thereby cr therefore creating openings in the south zone. Oops, poops. Yes, you guys saw that email. He ended that paragraph with oops, poops. None of you called him out on the ignorance of his email. Is it because you believe this too? that it is expected to have vacancies in Watsonville schools, so oops poops? Do you not care that thousands of students in our high schools do not have a teacher of record in science, math, SELPA, and other and world language classes? Or is it more important to remove items from high shelves? Our <laughs> teachers are burnt out. No, it's not for reasons that district admin has stated to me. Those reasons being, oh, they're burnt out. They're, it's just because teachers are shocked by having to work more than four hours than they did in the remote year. What? Um, no, it's not because they don't know how to manage their time. Um, and teachers are not the reason there is a teacher shortage. We have asked the district to give our teachers, all of them across the district, at least one hour a month on a Wednesday afternoon so that they can focus on their own classroom commitments because they are filling in in classes. You refuse to give this to them. One hour, one hour. There are districts across this nation making adjustments to their schedules to give teachers extra time to prep and some even time off, paid, because they're acknowledging that the mental health of their teachers is important. I'm gonna repeat what I've stated in the past. It's the same exact um, paragraph that I stated in the past. The PVFT has shared many times that our working environment is our students' learning environment. We base our advocacy on the belief that it is our students who win when we win. The district will not only receive a total of close to a million in COVID funding, the additional 5% cost of living adjustment is nine million, that's for this school year. We are only negotiating for this school year. $9 million extra in the base funding. That's not one-time monies. Funds that, sh these, this funding should go to, to the salaries. And you know, again, trying to put it in context, a 1% is on just under a million dollars for our unit, all the people we represent. So if we wanted to keep up just above what inflation is right now, maybe a 7% raise, that would only be not even 7 million of that 9 million. So that includes all statutories, just so you know. Again, this benefits our students. When they have teachers, prioritize our students. Um, 
This benefits our, our students when they have teachers. Prioritize our students, invest in the educators that work with them. I want to point out that there was this um, uh, a press release for the safety measures um, promoted for you know social emotional health among students and then a comma staff. Um, one of the sentences is um, in, in the first paragraph, equally important to PBUSD is a profound sense of responsibility to the families it serves to create safe spaces where students can truly unleash their learning potential. There are students without a teacher. There are thousands of students losing hope in their education. You have teachers who are doing all they can and some and giving up family time to do that to help their students. And they can't get an hour because they don't know how to manage their time otherwise. Time. Thank you. Do we have anyone here from CSEA? Okay, no one from CSEA? How about from uh, Pavam? Can we use the same mic? <laughs> I don't know. You might have to put it up and down. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, Board President Holm, Vice President Shocker, who I guess is not here. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board, uh, Pam Shanks, and I, Brian Saxton, are here tonight to represent Pavam. Excuse me. I start with a question. Have you ever read a job description and seen the line that says other duties as assigned and wondered what that meant? What are all those other duties and who does them? And why would anyone take a job with that line in it. I'm here to let you know of the people who fulfilled other duties as assigned. These would be the proud members of Pavam. During the beginning of this year, and even today, Pavam members are filling many other duties as assigned. Uh, they have been reading teachers, science teachers, math teachers, social studies teachers, PE teachers, first grade teachers, lots of other teachers and grades. They have been COVID monitors, COVID testers, vaccine monitors, vaccine clinic facilitators, crossing guards, yard duties, bus dispatchers, custodians, lunch line assistants, delivery drivers, staff accountants. They've been principals, assistant principals, uh, bus drivers again, office assistants, phone call answerers. I don't think that's a word, but they've done that. Counselors, social support, tech assistants, COVID test collectors, and I think you get the point. Each of those jobs was taken without hesitation, without complaint, at least out loud, and done to the best of their ability. Pavam leaders are unselfish and willing to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. It is one of the many great things about them. As a collective, we are reading the book Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. In there, she talks about being vulnerable and leading from the heart and being a daring leader. This is what our Pavam team is doing. We are stepping out of our comfort zone and being vulnerable. We are telling people how we feel, acknowledging others, and leading from the heart. Daring leaders take on challenges. They acknowledge when they need to help and empower others to do their best. So thank, thank you. you, PBSD Cares. Thank you. Anyone from CWA? All right. Go on to item 10.1, um, accept PVUSD's Sunshine Proposal to PVFT for the 2021-2022 school year. The report will be presented by Allison Niazawa. Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. The item for you tonight is our Sunshine Proposal with PVFT for the 21-22 school year. Um, we're Sunshine the Health and Welfare article. Um, we do recognize that benefits are a, are a challenge to discuss and we know that they're very important to all of our membership and all of our employees. Um, what we're looking for in Sunshine in this article is to be able to have as many options on the table when negotiating with PVFT 
um, because we do recognize that you know salary is important as well and so we're just trying to open our options so that we have we can have a comprehensive conversation and look at total compensation across the board to hopefully um, come together and, and find a resolution so I request that you approve the item for tonight do we have any public speakers to this item we do one Radhika. 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 I'm sorry for butchering your name oh. so good evening board of trustees and dr. Rodriguez um, I'm not gonna say anything up here that you haven't heard all night but we are teachers we're used to repeating ourselves so we are thankful that the district has sunshine because that allows us to begin negotiating in good faith. However, it's really disappointing to see the opening of the health and welfare article. We're currently working amidst a worldwide pandemic. Um, I believe it reflects poorly on the district's commitment to their whole child, whole family, whole community of PBUSD. What we wish to accomplish for our membership is an agreement where the whole child, whole family, and whole community is addressed. An agreement that is going to attract teachers beginning in the spring and retain the teachers, the quality teachers we currently have on staff. An agreement where we're not at, the t at this current position we are in, faced with the severe number of shortages and the impact that that has on our students that you have been hearing all night. Currently, if we returned our teachers on special assignment to their positions as support for our classroom teachers, we would be looking at 62.6 .6 FTE vacancies in November. The district made commitments to hire additional intervention teachers, additional counselors, additional support staff. Right now, half of those intervention positions are vacant. We are not serving the whole child. What does that look like? It looks like offering a salary and total comp that attracts teachers. And so we have fully staffed sites to support all of our learners. We have said this many times before, but I'm gonna say it again. You cannot put students first if you put teachers last. Thank you. All right, do we have any discussion from the board? Okay. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this sunshine item. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, motion carries 6-1. Six zero one. Oh, five. thank you. Five zero one. Five one zero. Thank you. All right. Go on, on to item 10.2, approve memorandum of understanding with CSEA uh, chapter, yeah. yeah, and PVSD for the summer assistance program. Yeah. Report would be presented by Allison Yazawa. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, we have been participating in the summer assistance program for our classified employees where the state provides a one-to-one -one matching dollar for any classified employees who pay into the fund. Um, and so we get those, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Um, so the notices go out um, in around December, early January for employees who would like to participate. And so I would respectfully request that the board approves the MOU to participate in the summer assistance for our classified employees for the 22-23 school year. Do you have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Any discussion from the board? This is the same summer program as that we do every summer. We're just re-upping it. We're just, yeah, it's an annual MOU, and okay. so 
we're bringing it forward back again. We okay. Have to continue. This is a really exciting program, and yeah, I'd like to support this. So I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that motion. Is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I will call for the vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. So let's see. So that carries uh, six zero. Six six. Six zero one. Sorry. Okay. Um, resolution twenty one twenty two nineteen increasing revolving cash fund report will be presented by Clint Rucker. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So as you all may have recalled, um, back from my budget presentation, we talked about unemployment insurance and the drastic increase that happened at the state level. They did end up lowering it a little bit, but it still ended up quite a bit more than uh, typically it's been. It went up to about 0 0.02 when it used to be about 0 0.005. Um, because of that, it's actually forced us to increase our revolving cash fund. I want to clarify, this does not mean that we're spending um, committing any additional funds to anything. This is already in the budget, that increase in unemployment. It's just that EDD requires us to wire the money over and our actual treasury can't do it in a timely manner to not get penalties. So it's one of the very few things we use our revolving cash for and we just need to increase that cash to be able to continue to pay those unemployment, um, that unemployment insurance in a timely manner. So at this point, I just recommend that the board approve this resolution to increase our revolving cash balance. All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Can I have a motion? Make a yeah, motion to, to approve. approve. Sorry, second. All right, I've got a first yeah, and a second. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Item 10.4, resolution 21-22-20 to utilize grant funding for construction projects. Still you, Clint. Thank you again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So this one's a little bit complicated, so I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, as many of you know, a few a board meeting ago, actually, we approved a resolution to support a new bond um, at the state level. Currently, the state does have a bond out there. Uh, it goes through the OPSC, which is the Office of Public School Construction. We, um, as you may have remembered in that resolution, have projects already in the queue for some of that money, bond money that was out there. In working with school facility consultants who works with us very closely on all of our OPSC bids, our um, applications, we found that we actually are um, potentially able to get $3 million in construction funding through OPSC for a Valencia project we did and an Aptos Junior High project. It was both portable projects that we did back in about the summer of 2018. Um, these projects have eligibility, which means that they do meet the requirements and we do show that the construction was a need for student housing, therefore we are able to get that money for it. However, we don't have enough in the K through eight levels to fund the entire pro projects or to fund really 50% of the project, which is what OPC, OPSC will contribute. So what we're asking the board to do is approve a resolution that allows us to borrow our eligibility. So we're not borrowing any money, we don't have to pay it back. It's just saying we have eligibility at the nine to 12 level but we don't have any projects at the 9 to 12 level that qualify. So what we'd like to use, do is use that eligibility from the 9 to 12 level to support the projects that were done at Valencia and Aptos Junior. What this does is it effectively lets us get more money for those projects. If we don't do this resolution and do not choose to borrow from that 9 to 12, that money will simply just expire. There's nothing we get to do to try and go after it. Uh, after that, we do have um, one project that could potentially qualify at PV High, um, but by the time that project would qualify, we would be in a new round of eligibility and this current money would be gone anyway. So really it's a win-win for us to apply and try and put forth as much eligibility as possible. And again, a potential of $3 million towards our construction projects. So I would ask that the board approve this resolution. Thank you, Clint. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We don't. Any discussion from the board? I just have a follow -up. So this is specifically So it is to reimburse us for those projects. Those projects were done with Measure L funding, which means OP OPSC has guidelines that says you must use that money in a similar fashion to what the original money was for. So it does not necessarily mean that $3 million needs to now be spent on Aptos 
and on Valencia, it simply means we have $3 million to spend on construction or facilities projects. So, Thank you. yeah, of course. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. All right. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, so this is what we've been waiting for is this matching money because we had hoped from 2010 that we would have a lot of matching money. So what about PV High? What about the field? There's no match for Not any for of that field. construction? Not for the field. There's a project for um, some of their repairs that they did and some of the um, work on one of their wings that uh, I have with school facilities that they believe could be eligibility. But again, as they are going through the process, OPSC is very behind. So again, we're funding a project back from 2018 right now. Um, so again, in, in asking our consultant, do we feel that we would have money for that project? He said one, um, in the next set of rounds, he believes we would have eligibility. And two, we, um, if the new state bond passes, then we would have even more eligibility. One thing I did neglect to mention that I do want to mention is one of the reasons we're pushing for this right now with OPSC is, as you all know, we're in declining enrollment along with every other really district in the state. Um, OPSC is giving a one-time use of our 2019-20 enrollment to determine our eligibility. So this is actually kind of double letting us not only borrow from that 9 to 12, but also use eligibility that otherwise we would lose out on because our declining enrollment is showing that we get less and less construction dollars. And there's really no other projects that we could put in the queue for this money? We have. Um, we so, have so as you all know, we have the Duncan projects. Holbert uh, portables that we're working on. We are actually going to put that project into the queue. Uh -huh. um, I'm working with school facility consultants to determine if we can use the ESSER projects. I believe because they're federally funded, they don't qualify for OPSC. Uh -huh. um, but again, any construction projects that we work on, we always send off um, to SFC to review and see if we can put in applications. Okay, because I thought we had lots of projects that were already queued up with the state, and and then but we, we was like get at the end of the line, and there was already like hundreds ahead of us. So we have other projects that are queued. We don't have eligibility for those projects mm -hmm. at this time. So the two that we have eligibility for are Aptos Junior and Valencia. Okay, so there's a motion. I'll second. If there's no further discussion, then I will call the vote. All yeah. the. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Um, item 10.5 uh, Sugimura Finney uh, Architects Agreement. Okay. Uh, Calabasas, uh, the re roof pro project, and it'll be uh, Gary Webb. Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, this is a uh, architectural agreement with Sugi, uh, Sugimura Finney Architects for Calabasas Elementary School HVAC and re-roof repair project. This is a combined project for re-roofing and replacement of all HVAC equipment at Calabasas. Um, long overdue. Uh, it's, it is budgeted. It's uh, funded through the ESSER funds, which we've approved at the uh, Board meeting a few board meetings ago, and um, this is the total construction estimate is 1.85 million, and the uh, project compensation is $200,000. And uh, I recommend that you approve this. All right. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Um, any discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Do I have a second? A second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right. So before we uh, continue on to the next item, I am going to make a motion to extend the meeting to 1130 in case we need that additional time. Thank you. I have a, a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5-1-1. One, one. Um, item 10.6, uh, so you can hurry, Finney Architects Agreement, Lakeview Middle School, uh, C&D Reroof Project. Gary, I'm assuming that's still you. Still me. Uh, thank you very much, President Holm. Uh, this is another agreement with Suga, uh, Sugimura Finney Architects for Lakeview Middle School Buildings C and D re-roofing project. 
Uh, the dollar amount's forty thousand dollars. This is also through ESSER funding. Um, the construction estimate is seven hundred thousand dollars, and I recommend that we approve this action item. Any public speakers to this item? No. Any discussion from the board? Just a question. Is this is this a repair to the roof, or this is a full roof? This is a full. And it's only seven hundred thousand. Uh, C and D wings are not that big. One section of it's already been re-roofed. I see. Okay, yeah. so it's not so the full it needs school. Bit, um, I'm not sure exactly how many more sections are be done, but just just C and D buildings. Okay, right. great. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. I've got a first. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So, is, are these replacing the gravel roofs on those units? Correct. Okay. Yeah, those yeah, most of the failures have been around the scupper areas. Of yeah, the wall. yeah, leaking into the walls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. All right. Care to second? <laughs> I'll give you that second. All right. Um, I have a first <laughs> and a second, <laughs> and one aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries uh, six zero one. Thank you very much, President Hall. All right, item 10.8, our paper education. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, MOU between Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health and Pajaro Valley SELPA. The report will be presented by Heather Gorman, our SELPA Director of Special Services. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. So this is an ongoing MOU that the district has had in place um, to support some of our most vulnerable students in the highest tier of need. Under the California Assembly Bill 114, school districts are responsible for providing mental health services to students with disabilities. This legislation also provides funds to our SELPA and other SELPAs throughout the state to be used for educationally related mental health services. The MOU is educated the MOU is funded from grant money that is specifically designated to support students with IEPs that have mental health needs. We partner with the county behavioral health in part because they have community resources that benefit our students, including um, access to a psychiatrist that can work with students and their families. This current MOU is for two school years. The services provided by County Behavioral Health may include a full range of therapeutic services, such as assessments, plan development, individual, family, and group counseling, case management, and collateral services. In addition, they work directly with our RISE program and support our Tier 3 referral process. I hope you choose to approve this MOU. Thank you. All right, do we have any public speakers for this item? We do not. All right, any discussion from the board? Um, I, I do, just a quick question. Sure. So how are families going to know of the services? How Is it just, it, yeah, so, or so I guess can you elaborate on the tier three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically these services are provided through the IEP process. Okay. So we do look at a referral process for students that may be in need of this type of mental health services. Mm -hmm. And when they do receive it, it could be individual services, they could do group um, counseling, or they can do family services. So that is, but it's part of the IEP process. Mm -hmm. It is. Got it. Thank you. All right, can I get a motion? Move to approve. I'll second. Yeah. I'll all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 502. I Thank think you. Oscar's away from his seat. Right. Oh, okay. Thanks. 10.8 Paper Education Academic Tutoring Contract. A report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thanks so much. So one thing when we went out for both of our surveys and also our town halls and our thought exchange the top ranking response from parents and students was access to additional tutoring supports so part of that was the development of these learning hubs and so we are reorganizing facilities at all of our high schools um, including our alternative ed high schools including new school and renaissance 
Um, in January, when we come back, they will begin starting to use that, um, that resource. We currently will have two other type of tutors within that setting. So we are gonna have some UCSC tutors and also some pupils tutors, which are migrant education tutors. Apart from that, we wanna make sure that we are able to provide 24 seven tutoring support. So paper education is currently in thousands of school districts and they are able to provide multilingual tutors. So they are able to provide in four languages, um, Sp English, Spanish, Mandarin, and French. For us, of course, English and Spanish is the most important. Mm -hmm. So within 15 seconds, they can, um, they can connect with the live tutor. So we met with them. They had a model that was not going to fit us. So I was able to speak with the CEO and come up with a new model for PVUSD because we believe that vendors should do what we need them to do and not um, what um, they want us to do. So what will happen is each middle school and high school will receive a set of um, these licenses so that when students um, or whether it's um, student study teams or it is the site or district wellness team or they come to these learning hubs, they will be offered this license which will allow them to do it. Um, we decided that we wanted to pilot with them and so that again was something different that they have not done in the past. And so we're doing a thousand licenses. They did come down in the price so that it is reasonable. And what we'll do is we will, for this next year, we will watch our students and how much they access it. Um, and if they do, then we will come back and um, bring the board back another plan. But at this moment, we're just talking about 8,000 licenses. This was included in already in the expanded learning opportunities plan. And so, this is just um, one of the vehicles in order to be able to provide that extra tutoring support um, that has already been um, approved in the general plan, but this is the specific contract. So we're really excited to start it and um, see how this helps our students. All of the people who they receive support from are licensed and credentialed teachers. I think what I, what I appreciate about this, which is different, is the students will choose the content area. So if they are wanting to do support in math, they will specifically be sourced to a math teacher. Or if they're um, needing support in science, they will be specifically sourced to science. And um, that is unique and different from other tutoring supports out there. Um, and this company has found that the, the biggest time where they receive the support is about 10 p.m. And so we're excited that our students will have this opportunity when they need the support, they'll be able to log in independently on the Chromebook that they have from the district and um, still utilizing the 4,500 hotspots that we have out there from our district. And so I request the approval of this um, support. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We don't. Uh, any discussion from the board? <laughs> I do. I have a couple questions, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned it is only a pilot program. So how many schools or at what schools would it be at or are all? It's at every middle and high school. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And that includes um, our dependent charter schools? For their middle school students, yes. Okay. Not for their elementary students. Thank you. So it would be available for their sixth to eighth grade students. Got it. Um, how about our Misteco students? Or is there anything that we're doing to yeah. address that need? So I mean, it pr probably what I would recommend them, especially at the high school, is to use the pupils tutors and so to use our in-person tutors. Um, unfortunately, this company doesn't provide support to Misteco Bajo. Um, yeah, I mean, they're really our Mesteco Bajo students are, are really brilliant because they, they 
are usually trilingual, right? They usually are um, learning English as well, and then because of the environment that they're in, that they learn, they know Spanish as well, and then mm -hmm. Meseco Bajo. Um, but what I would say is I would probably encourage them to access the learning hubs and go and get the support from the UCSC tutors and the pupils tutors. Okay. Um, so they do have someone, we do have something in place in case they need access yeah, to someone um, who speaks Mesteco. The, the, the unfortunate piece is the learning hubs will only be open most likely until about 5.30 versus this is 24-7. Um, so they still would be able to do it, but they would have to receive that support in English or Spanish. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Chief. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have a comment or question? Mm, no, I don't oh. think so. Oh, okay. Did, All right. Did she have a question? Um, can I have a motion? Oh, I'll make I a motion you. to approve. And I'll second. I actually did have one question. Okay. Um, how will we know if this program is working, like the efficacy and the... Yeah. Kind of so we'll be able to track the students and according to the various um, assessments that we have. So we'll be looking at specifically DNF rates, so grades, and we'll also be looking at their MAP scores. Um, to see how they're doing and how they're progressing, specifically on whether or not they're accessing it and how well they're accessing it. There's a data dashboard that we'll make sure and track um, so that we can see the number of hours and we'll definitely be providing um, an update for you, especially if we come back and decide to expand the program, we will um, provide that update for you. Okay, I think, um, I think our students are just kind of burned out of online learning kind of platforms. So I'm, I'll be interested to see how well this works. Yeah, I'm just speaking about my own daughter who's a junior in college. Like she's just done with online. Yeah, right yeah now. I, I would say if, yeah, I would say they definitely are done with classes being online. Mm -hmm. um, they, we are still seeing students that are accessing these type of supports, but we're doing a pilot. So it's yeah. a pretty, really when you think about it, it's um, 16, over 16 schools. Um, it is only a thousand licenses, so it's really not yeah. not a large amount per. Yeah, I saw each that. School. It's like forty five thousand dollars total yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have first and second. Aye. Aye. None. Are there any items that the board wishes to propose? Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with deferring item 11.13 and 11.14. Um, I'll second again with gratitude to the donations yeah. that have come in that we've received for the Lagasse kitchen. Thank you to the donors. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries to 601. I think that my question is really with regards to both of these um, and looking at the backup on it, um, I, I believe if I recall correctly, these are both just going through till December, correct, of 2021. Um, and I know we've been doing this, I mean, pretty much this whole year, calendar year meeting, not academic year, right? Um, I, I just have to say, I find it, it really interesting that as a public K-12 institution that we're promoting spending money on promoting ourselves. Uh, it, it's a very unique sort of circumstance. I mean, we, you know, there's a public educational system in every community within the state of California and the country, right? It's, we're required to provide a free public K-12 education regardless of immigration status, right? So, um, 
I mean, I, I also have the sometimes fortune of, you know, um, of traveling a lot throughout the state with the nature of my work. And I have to say, I don't see other school districts, I mean, out of, you know, over a thousand school districts in the state, public school districts that really do this. So I'm just really wanting to see what, I mean, are we really seeing a benefit from, from doing this? You and, want to and go first? What, and what is that? Yeah. So have, I, we, have we seen an increase in enrollment because we are advertising Pajaro Valley Unified School District on all these different media networks? Yeah. So I, I don't think that it's just about publicizing that we're a school district and publicizing about our programs, although we do that as well. Right. We actually talk about many things on there. So it can be everything from kinder enrollment, which is related to um, enrollment to um, vaccines that we're providing. Um, we do a whole gamut. It really is dependent on what we're doing. So we did something on graduations prior. So when we were going to have graduations, the requirements of graduations is something that we put out there. Um, I actually would beg to differ that other school districts are not doing this. Some school districts, I mean, they are larger than us, even have their own rate, their own TV channel. And so um, they have people in house that are doing this. But for example, and it's just anecdotal, but it's kind of funny. So we we have one of, um, through some of these 30 second things that are done for us, mm -hmm. um, we have placed it like at the um, Green Valley Cinemas. And I have students when I'm in the schools that will be, that will say to me, I saw you, I saw you at the cinema. And when they first started telling me that, I thought they were talking about me personally. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't, I wasn't at the movies. And they're like, no, I saw you on the screen. Um, so we got such a great response from the English version. That's why we did the Spanish version, which is this one. Um, but it also is, it's not just for promotion, it is for displaying of information. Um, so just like DLAC, just this last um, Tuesday, they asked for us to continue to do more um, education and information about the vaccines. The, we did one on CARES and what does CARES mean, right? Connect, accelerate, recover, enrich, succeed. Um, and so I do think that it's important. I've had parents that have said that like at the trunk or tree, people are like, are you, you're Dr. Rodriguez, I've seen you on the video. So um, people um, do are learning about what we're doing in the system. Um, and I think that that's a, a good thing for it, especially since it's a pretty nominal amount. I mean, it's um, $3,780. And but that's just to continue until the end of December from and, now. And to through June, of through June. This goes from December through the end of June. And it is actually wonderful, if I may add, Dr. Rodriguez. It is important because there is a lot of competition. We are, we are right now also uh, promoting the hiring, hiring for PBUSD. We need, there's shortage everywhere, and that is one way of getting the word out there. Um, this is with Univision. Uh, we have had a, a contract with Telemundo, and we know that Univision is the second uh, TV channel that is watched by our families the most in this area. So uh, they gave us a very good rate to, uh, to start advertising with them, and we are doing the same, um, the same ad. Right now, the one that is running is about hiring for various, um, employment, including um, substitute teachers and uh, classified staff. It is the one you may have seen while we, where I was at a bus yard mm -hmm. it, with um, staff around, and then we were in the classroom as well. So um, I, I, I'd be fine with supporting. I just wanted some clarification, and then um, also maybe if it's brought back again for renewal, and not just whether it's in the Spanish version or the English version and or it's not a differentiation between that. Um, because yes, I absolutely believe whatever we're doing in English, we should be doing in Spanish, and what we're doing in Spanish, we should be doing in English, vice versa, right? But um, I would just like to see some, you know, what, what are we seeing of the benefits? Mm -hmm. What are the results? I mean, just that's just a common, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to know that there is a result 
and a benefit coming from it. Um, not that we're just spending it, even though, like as you say, it is a pretty nominal amount. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. So, yeah. um, with I just want to add that this is also uh, KS um, and KSBW. We also run that um, in English. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda item 11.13. I've got a second. Yeah, I've got a first. Second. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Okay. Motion carries 601. And item 11.14. I'll make a motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, 601. And we'll have our um, item 14.1, action report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? There is multiple, so. <laughs> so under item, uh, closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on November 17, 2021 with 13 and four additional action items. I've got a first, can I get a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Okay, under item, closed session item. Six, one abstention. So five zero zero one. Under closed session item two point two, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on November 17, 2021, with 13 and 10 additional action items. Can I get a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, trustee, uh, Director Abstain, so five zero zero one. All right. All right, under um, the same item, we do have uh, one announcement. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Stephanie Pumplin as the new coordinator of English Language Services. Stephanie has been serving students since 2002 as a teacher, administrator, and bilingual coordinator. She has also been a bilingual instructor working with English learners in a variety of capacities. She obtained her Bachelor's of Science degree in Education from the University of Wisconsin, um, Oshkosh, as well as a Master's in Education from the same institution. She obtained a second Master's degree in Educational Leadership from Marianne University. She holds a Wisconsin and Illinois Administrative Credential, a Wisconsin and Illinois Teaching Credential, and a California Teaching Credential with a B-clad. She has taught in California, Wisconsin, Illinois, and the Galapagos and Ecuador. Ms. Pomplin brings her 19 plus years of experience to this new role of coordinator. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new administrative role. Now under item 2.2, the board voted with a 403 vote to approve the settlement agreement with CSEA chapter 132 for case number SFCE 3433E. And under item 2.6, special education settlement for a student, the board voted with a 502 vote to approve the final um, compromise and release agreement for a special services student. Thank you. Our next meeting will be on December 8th, 2021. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at 1013.